You know, is, is that potentially a, a neonic? Is that a product that potentially could be labeled as a neonic there? I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if they, I don't think they do, but I'd have to look at the label to can see we, what they actually have we, for uh, What is the full active. full term? I'm going to have Ian pull up the actual, the neonic. Neonicotinoids. Nicotinoids. Can you try to Google that? There's no way in hell he's spelling that. Ne- <laughs> N-E-O-N-I-C-T-I-O-N-O-I-D-S. McDonald's. Sounds right. You're out. McDonald's. <laughs> I just want to read the definition. Could you use it in a sentence? <laughs> Jeremy swallowed a whole gallon of nicotinoids. <laughs> <laughs> now he is dead. <laughs> uh, uh. We're back. Hunter Podcast. Ew. Episode 19. There you go. It's been a shitty week. Has it? Yes. With, let's, Should have yesterday, I guess. Oh, uh, it's just been the week. Like I was supposed to go. <laughs> My week's been pretty good. <laughs> yeah, mine hasn't. <laughs> I was supposed to go and do the deer grow talk on Monday. Yeah, had I some, still think you should have done that. I know. Had some things that came up from a client side that had to take care of, so stayed here. Uh, didn't have a lunch plan, so I was like, man, I gotta go out and get lunch. You regret it? Well, I regret it because I went out to get lunch and I got pulled over. Mm. Um, trooper just doing his job. Me, apparently, not abided by the laws of vehicle traffic. You didn't signal, and you were speeding? Technically. What did he get you for? <clears throat> what did he write on the ticket? Uh, <laughs> not staying in my lane. Hmm. Best check yourself. Best check yourself. <laughs> Before you wreck yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, I thought, you know, and I, if I recall correctly, I did it to, uh, to move over for a disabled vehicle on the side of the road, which is like courtesy mm. it just failed the signal there is it right, right here on 119 it was like two minutes from the office <clears throat> so uh and They're at one point at one there. point in time i had four troopers parked behind me i thought they were going to do a cavity check or did something. you really yeah four different vehicles it's pretty serious wow. for a failure to signal doesn't seem like a funding issue no <laughs> Well, we are in like the, literally it was probably happening as like all of the new troopers coming out of the precinct were like going to deploy. I feel like when they see people, they have like their bodies pulled over. They're like, hey, hey. let's stop and see what, he's, see what he's got here. So, yeah. So that started it. That, that, that just, yeah, that day was just bad. Then Tuesday. Oh, that was Monday. That was Monday. <laughs> yeah, this week has been extremely long. Uh, Tuesday, uh, anybody following the podcast knows how amped we are for kansas and we didn't get drawn yeah i partially blame you for this not like directly i don't accept (laughs) not like directly but like no if anything i blame you no dude i had a seven year streak that's what i'm saying it was bound to eventually you weren't going to get drawn you've you're one for three the last three years you've drawn one time what well yeah five (laughs) five years is the Five years. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not going back that way. I'm just saying in the last... Well, it's not any better over five years. I'm three for five, I think, at this point. Is that right? Yeah, that's better than one for three. Okay. <laughs> Seems worse. Because <laughs> that's twice now. I will say that it's worse than seven <clears throat> for seven, which I am. Yeah. Was. Here's the plus side. We're guaranteed next year <laughs> now. Wow. That's half glass full. That's like uh, Weston telling me, hey, man, at least you have a bunch of five and six-year-olds next year. Get bent. That is true. Also, tired of this positivity. Yeah, it does suck. I mean, we're not. I I think. um, No, what sucks is the fact that we have very dependable stealth cam cellulars in the field that we will watch big bucks all year long and not be able to hunt. I know. That's what's going to suck. Yeah, it'll be like exciting and cool, but also. Hey, look at this giant. Can't hunt him. Just like dangling the candy in front of our faces. Hey, look at it. We were supposed to be in that tree stand this week. Yeah. You suck. Yeah. So. So that was Tuesday. We just basically <laughs> got to shift focus here and make some plans for. Can- so Kansas is like our November staple. Yes. That everything else kind of is <clears throat> ebbing and flowing around. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And in and around. In and around. And uh, so we'll probably shift that more towards Illinois is the thought. <clears throat> that is a thought. I mean, um, on a fortunate scenario, we've leased a bunch of properties through base camp leasing. So we have backups. Two. In Illinois. Mm -hmm. Well, just in general, but yes, Mm -hmm. two in Illinois. So, yeah, we're trying to shift our trip. I mean, dude, the one thing would be if we can pick something up in Indiana that, like, gets us excited about it. Like, I don't know. Maybe that's your... We have one. Your watch state. I know we just don't have the camera working. 
Uh, yeah, I need to get Mike out there, check that thing. How far is that from the the meeting in July? Far. We could if we drive out, we hit it on our way. I'd almost rather do that and just like not get another person on there. We can only afford one person. That's fine. I don't, we don't need pictures until we can keep then. an eye on Indiana in that area. Just, it, it, I mean, at this point, I'm kind of looking at that week before we were going to go to Kansas and just say, you know, how do we make this like a Midwestern trip and just hit, you know, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, kind of reverse order. So when we finish, we're within an hour, hour and a half from home. Mm -hmm. Why not? Odds are, if everything goes right, we tag out in Ohio early, but. Corey and my dad probably will still have tags, so yeah. maybe we're filming. But if we start in Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the only thing about Ohio is, like, we can hunt at any time. I'm a sloppy mess over this. This is just throwing a wrench into plans that was we were not expecting. Yeah. I still think it'd be cool to... We've got to make sure it's going to fit with everybody's schedule. Mm -hmm. But if we can get... If we can get enough to warrant a week there in Illinois. Like, I still think that would be the move. That probably would be the move. And then our thought was like, well, what if one of us kills out there early? Like, yep. first of all, that's pretty optimistic. And if that does happen, then I think you or I are both fine with sacrificing um, that week to just guide and be, be the cameraman that we need yeah. anyways. And we've had this other kind of concept of um, of what we were, we were calling a watch state, you know? Yeah. So maybe <clears throat> a Wisconsin or Minnesota, probably not a Missouri. Um, but, but potentially having a place to go to keep eyes on. And if, if that turns out to be, you know, of high interest and opportunity, the, the problem where we're lacking in some of these trips and, and even in an Illinois where Kansas had is, is just area as it comes down to public and private hunting opportunities yeah. with four of us. Well, and what I was saying earlier is too, is like, if, if we, if your dad and Corey were, um, you know, just pros at running and gunning, which, which I mean, no offense, like oh, yeah. they just prefer a stand that, you know, has been set. Yeah, they just haven't done it as much. And so that's why Kansas works out great because we have a bunch of stands hung. Mm -hmm. In Illinois, <clears throat> you know, the glass half full way to look at this is like, well, it's going to force us to figure out Illinois. Well, I think we're going to have, we'll have at least two to four stand placements done at the end of July when we're out for the for the deer grow meeting. Yeah, some of those are really good stands. Yeah, it, it'll be just what are we running gun with And who in knows? Between. Like, yeah, maybe you throw whatever one of those guys into, you know, that union. Mm-hmm. Uh, funnel and they kill first second day then it's a very possible throw somebody else in there yeah very possible yeah there will be a big buck in, in there it was cool we had a um, we still need to f we should still make sure we get that food plot taken care of i still think that's mm -hmm. pretty important well that's what I was maybe even more so now that's what i was going to go into is you know we had a, a viewer essentially write us and say that they uh, were listening to us talking about southern illinois and where we're hunting and they hunt in that area they have like 800 acres on a lease there and basically said, you know, number one was kind of giving some insight on like tons of deer, some really good bucks. Gun season comes in, a lot of hunting pressure, but Bo will probably be okay. <clears throat> but also they have some really good contacts that could potentially go over there and say, you know, drop a pin and say, hey, this is up and just sit, go there and plant it. Like they'll have it ready to go. We just put the seed in the ground. Um, so that's cool. It's not something I expected. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that'll be a move, man. We'll just, um, let's get that feed plot in. We've got at least two, maybe three, you know, solid ready to go placements. And I think there's a lot more public for us to dive into and figure out. Mm -hmm. And still not rolling out a watch state. Oklahoma's come up as a potential watch state for us of another opportunity over the counter. Um, obviously that we're curious about that. Wisconsin, Minnesota area, which kind of ties in today's guest. Yeah, maybe uh, Eric can fill us in. Yeah, Dr. Eric Mitchell uh, from a native of Wisconsin, uh, but works as the farmland deer biologist for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And so, you know, Eric's had experience on both ends. He's got a family farm in Wisconsin that maybe he'd like to have us come shoot deer on, possibly. Possibly you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and obviously experience in Minnesota as as one of the deer biologists for the DNR. And so uh, Eric and I know each other uh, from Mississippi State. He actually uh, came in to take over the research projects that, that my wife Emily and I were working on and uh, finished that environment and genetics uh, project that we had talked about with Bronson Strickland you know, a few podcasts ago. Um, and we'll probably dive back in with Eric just because you know I know he finished out that research. So there's probably some, some points and some takeaways there that we can talk to. But 
uh, ended up then um, going for his PhD. He's been in South Dakota and now in um, Minnesota working for the state. So that transition from, you know, we kind of talked with Eric about it this morning, from the academic world to the state world is is a big one. It's a big gap. Just from understanding, you know, you're dealing with academics and research is one thing. Now at the state level, it's just all people management, basically. <laughs> so be something to get into with him on that side. But um, yeah, let's uh, let's bring Dr. Eric Mitchell up. There he is. Good morning. Waiting What's patiently. up, dude? How's it going? Oh, not too bad, man. We were just kind of transitioning into you there. Um, you know, one of the things that Jared had been talking about with me is like uh, these kind of watch states of places that we've, you know, never hunted, but we've always said, man, it, you know, we hear good things about it. And, and in your case, it's your native state of Wisconsin uh, and your current state of Minnesota as being, you know, areas that it, we know have such a rich deer hunting tradition um, and maybe it's not like it used to be back in the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, but it still seems like people are killing some pretty good bucks from those two states. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of big deer that get shot out of Wisconsin and, uh, Minnesota both. So, yeah. And I know you grew Definitely. up, you grew up on a, what, a cattle farm in Wisconsin? <laughs> Dairy farm. Dairy yep. farm. Yep. And which, which part of the state? Southwestern. So about halfway between Mass and La Crosse. Mm -hmm. mm. And I mean, you've, I know, um, when you came to, to Mississippi, we had plenty of discussions just cause it was kind of what I was used to in Pennsylvania and that like, you know, essentially you lived and you grew up in that area, you were around for all the deer seasons, then you move that far distance and it's just like instantly kind of breaks that cycle. You know, you, yeah. you don't get to go back to the family farm, the traditions that you've had from a deer hunting scenario are, are broken. And now you've got to adapt to where in case, you know, for us, when we were in Starkville, you know, the land of pines and deer hunting, which is just a completely <laughs> different world than we've ever expected or, or, you know, hunted in uh, up until that point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was, uh, you know, growing up, everybody coming to deer camp, which was, you know, where we lived on the farm, we had friends that would come in. That was always a big deal coming in the day before uh, deer season. When I went off to college at Stevens point, <clears throat> excuse me. It was always driving back to back home, seeing all the cars <clears throat> uh, driving north, and we were heading south because that's you know one of the big traditions in Wisconsin is heading to the Northwoods to go deer hunting, right? So I always felt a little bit out of place, but once I got home, it was always it was always fun to be home. That's but, for sure. And that's a funny thing because like I think Pennsylvania is very similar to that. Um, we're actually working on a, a relationship here with the the Pennsylvania Game Commission and the podcast to try to get some of the guys in from from there, but. <laughs> You know, it used to be traditionally that people would leave, you know, even where we're at here in the southwest corner and they would flood, you know, flood to the, the north woods, right? The big woods, as it was said, for deer camp and stuff. And like slowly but surely, you know, people started to realize like, wait a minute, there's way more deer or there's way bigger deer where I live. Why am I, you know, flooding to those places? And from an economic standpoint, you know, it's really kind of suffocated some of those small towns that depended on just massive rushes of hunters coming in around the Thanksgiving time frame for rifle season, especially, you know, to hunt in those North woods, because now people are just, you know, staying back home and, and, and hunting closer to home and, and where they've kind of been the entire year, essentially. Yeah. I mean, in Wisconsin growing up, a lot of people had, you know, their 40 acres and they'd go to the North woods and that was a tradition. That's where deer hunting used to be strongest. I mean, think back in the thirties, forties, fifties, you had a lot going on. You had a lot of timber harvest that was recreating, um, early successional growth. That's really high quality deer habitat. You had extirpation, local extirpation of predators. So you didn't have nearly as many wolves or bears, which obviously those two species eat deer. No, no yeah. doubt about that. Uh, so you had this influx, this huge increase in the deer population. That's where everybody went. And then things just kind of changed over time. And, and now the Southern part of the state is definitely where you have your high deer densities, you have a lot of big deer. Uh, that's where a lot of people target to go hunting. Very cool, man. Talk a little bit about where you're at now in, in Minnesota. Um, you know, I know it seems like your, your focus, uh, personally is on the, the farmland side of things, the agricultural side of things, but I mean, you have a pretty diverse state, um, in terms of kind of what we just talked about from, you know, North, Northern part of the state, more big woods to the ag based, uh, side of the state. 
you know, what, what are you guys looking at from a, from a state level, I guess, around the deer populations and, and maybe just kind of give some of the listeners like a breakdown of, of what you have there in Minnesota and how it's kind of viewed upon from the state level? Sure. So yeah, we have a very diverse state. We have everything from uh, the big nor- woods up in the, the northeastern part of the state and that transitions into the, the agricultural region here in the, the southwest. Uh, we have what's called the transition zone. And that is that transition between the agricultural region and the forested region. And in the southeastern part of the state, we have part of the driftless region. So it's very similar to what I grew up with back in southwestern Wisconsin, where it's an area that was never touched by the glaciers. So you have these huge ridges and valleys, um, and you have a lot of historically dairy farms. So you have about 50% agriculture, 50% timber, really high quality deer habitat. Um, And we have a lot of really high quality deer habitat in that transition zone as well. You get that um, early successional habitat um in that area and just promotes a lot of uh really high deer densities is that, some really good deer in that region is that kind of the same i know at least from a from an iowa standpoint we hear often about like the driftless area and stuff is that kind of the same setup same same type of habitat yep so i mean the driftless region uh covers southwestern wisconsin southeastern minnesota northeastern iowa northwestern illinois just that's that corner right there in those four states that's where uh, during the glacial periods, the glaciers never actually hit. So you've got a lot of the, the really hilly terrain, ridges and valleys. Hmm. Sounds like a place we should be watching. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> I know a place you could probably go in Wisconsin if you guys need a place to, to get on. And now he's our favorite podcast guest. We'll talk. <laughs> we'll talk. We, we were just talking before the podcast. We found out yesterday that we didn't draw in Kansas. And uh, that's kind oh, of really? that's our staple trip, like almost every it's year. It's Jared's fault, not mine. Yeah. Maybe. <clears throat> He's there, bad luck. There's four of us that um well, the fourth would be an addition this year, but like mm-hmm. there's there's been a group of us going to Kansas every year for the past I mean, Jeremy's been going for seven years. Yeah. I've been attempting to go for five. Mm-hmm. Your dad's been coming for three, four. Four, yeah. And uh yeah, we found out yesterday we didn't draw, so it was like, man, that was like one of the stapled trips. So we're even right now we're kind of like man do we look at oklahoma do we look at wisconsin do we try to pick up another state do we just focus more around some of the public and stuff that we have in illinois yeah we so we've got some leases currently in southern illinois uh we have one lease in uh, indiana we've got a a place closer to home here in ohio so we've got some other spots that we're going to be hunting but you know typically we have um well in the last two years we have two big trips we're going uh and i know some of this is your old stomping grounds but we have a um, mule deer hunt in early September where we're going to start in South Dakota, uh, hunt the first few days of the opener in South Dakota for mule deer, and then end up in North Dakota where we drew this year. Um, we and Jared and I drew last year. We both killed bucks w- on I public. I will there. say, ch- chances are we probably won't draw in North Dakota next year. Good chance, but we're guaranteed in Kansas, so we might do a flip flop. So we'll have to figure something else out. Yeah, and, and, and so Eric, I know. Um, a lot of people probably watching this don't know you you were in south dakota for how many years three <clears throat> three years in total and was yep. that postdoc work that you were doing there yep that was my postdoc at work uh, i was working um working with john jenks uh, out of out of south dakota state university yep what was your research on when you were in south dakota so dr jenks had done i mean he's retired now he just recently retired but he had a full career of looking at um adult movement uh, had several adult movement studies, several fawn studies across Southern Minnesota, South Dakota, and North Dakota. So basically they were looking for somebody to come in and compile all that data and just do these big, large, almost meta-analysis type of, um, yep. type of work. So I focused mainly on fawn survival and how fawn survival varied in a, you know, what we call a fragmented landscape over of, uh, the Northern Great Plains where there's a lot of agriculture. Of white tails? Of white tails. Yep. Yep. So I know we, um, Let's dive down into this research hole. <clears throat> we uh, we talked with Bronson a couple weeks ago on the podcast, and you know one of the things that we kind of beat to death there was um, looking at the adult movement studies that we had, and and in particular, you know Bronson and those guys at the at the MSU Deer Lab had done a lot of research around comparison or or debunking of a lot of the moon stuff, right? Um, in terms of moon overfoot, underfoot, um, moon phases, etc. 
you know, and really even looking at some of the stuff that like um, Dr. Stephen Webb and Dr. Andy Little did in Oklahoma, you know, with the hunter pressure and stuff. Uh, had you guys looked at any of the data from Dr. Jenks in, in that formats um, in terms of like uh, when you're looking at movement, is it purely from a dispersal standpoint or, or, or are you looking at other movements in terms of hunter pressure or fragmentation of landscape? It's uh, mostly looking at it from the, the standpoint of migration. <clears throat> so we don't really think about migration occurring on the Great Plains, right? but it does. <clears throat> you know, a lot of times we think about it in the North Woods of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, up in the UP, where deer are moving to the wintering grounds, um, to their, their yarding areas. But in the, the prairies, they also migrate. They're going to travel quite a long ways to get to wherever they need to go. And we think that primary driver is, uh, is nutrition, is food. I mean, that makes the most sense, right? But one of the things, and we're trying to wrap up a paper, uh, an analysis now, still collecting, um, we're not collecting data, trying to analyze the data, <clears throat> but basically looking at landscape that's found within uh, a doe's home range mm -hmm. and seeing if we can't relate any of that to um, be able to predict whether that, that doe is going to um, migrate during the winter time. Looking at home range size, the different uh, composition of, of habitat within that home range, see if there's any indicators there that might, you know, give us a heads up of what deer are queuing in on and what might actually cause them to or be related to them migrating uh, over hmm. winter. What what would, qual would qualify as a uh, migration as opposed to just like a seasonal shift? Yeah, that's a good point. So basically, two separate home ranges. So they'll have a distinct summer home range and a distinct winter home range, and then coming back um, to that to that summer range. Versus kind of that seasonal shift where we're still seeing them utilize a a standardized home range, though their core focus or efforts may shift within that home range. Exactly. Exactly. They have a completely different home range. They're huh. not just using a different portion of their previously established. Is there like range. a uh, <clears throat> is there like a, a distance that's kind of the deciding factor to say like okay this is actually a different like it's one mile plus or that's a that's a really good question. So we don't have necessarily an established uh, distance for migration. It's kind of all across the board. What we're looking for is essentially just non overlapping of those home ranges. So you could have two home ranges relatively close, but as long as they're distinct home ranges, yeah, then we consider that consider that a migration. And you have a wide range of distances that deer will migrate depending upon um, available resources. And that's done primarily with tracking, like tracking collars. Yep, we had VHF collars uh, for all those studies, yep. but a lot of people are starting to switch to the GPS collars. What's VHF? How does that work? So basically, instead of like the GPS collars. Most people, it works just like you would think. It sends up a point on a predetermined schedule, right? So right now we're working with GPS collars for some of our pawn work. And we get a location, I think, every four hours that basically it pings and takes location of that animal. For BHF, you have to go out with actual telemetry gear and hone in on that animal. Old so school style. You, old school style. So you're going out, you're taking three locations to try to triangulate where that animal is. Uh, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of studies previously would use the BHF collars just as an indicator of mortality. Yep. So you put a VHF collar on, if a deer dies, basically, if it's, if it doesn't move for, you can set this time li uh, limit as well, but essentially four to eight hours, it'll put out a different signal. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you drive around, pick up that signal. If you hear uh, the increased uh, beeping, then you know, you have a mortality. Basically, I think it's two beeps per second or something like that. And you go in and investigate the mortality site. So there's a lot of different uses for for those VHF collars and GPS collars. It just depends on what your your question is. We would do that a lot when I, um, I can fit one of those in my day pack. Yeah, right. <laughs> we did that. So when we when I worked at the Smithsonian, we would do that. We had bucks and does collared and we essentially would drive around and you would triangulate to yeah. try to get a, a hone in. But like Eric was saying is, you know, you would find these. Um, uh, these mortality signals and, and a lot of, I know when you're talking about like from a fawn standpoint, not to get graphic on anyone, but we, we call them BATs, but essentially they're implants, um, that are put into a doe that when she has fawns, it pushes the tracking device out. And at that point you get that increased signal to then hopefully go find those fawns and then potentially call them. Right. Eric? Yep. 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 So you have a temperature differential between, uh, internal temp of the doe and the external temp of the environment. And when that fawn is born and that, that bit is pushed out, it triggers a signal and okay. then you can go out and just search the area to find the fawn. Which is harder than it sounds. I bet. Very, yes. Needle, needle <laughs> yes, in the haystack. Yeah. I wonder when you start talking about, um, and kind of tying into some of our past podcasts, Eric is like, uh, so we had Jeff Sturgis on not too long ago. Jeff just recently purchased the fawn, uh, farm there in, uh, Minnesota. You know, and one of the things that he's very adamant about, and it kind of counter 
counterproductive at least to a little bit what we typically think is like he doesn't really care if he's seeing and you know the bucks that he's hunting in the summertime because he's like listen at the end of the day like, it's great to see him but it doesn't mean anything when it comes down to the fall and so if you're talking about some of these areas in the plains having purely migrational um type behavior you know it makes a ton of sense because like obviously if these deer are having two distinct core ranges uh, or home ranges that are different like I don't want to be the one that's piling in all the bucks in the summertime, knowing that those deer all have likely different home ranges in the fall, and I'm never going to see them during a hunting situation. I right? Think, I think it does really depend on the, when that migration occurs, though. So what it, what are you what are you defining there, Eric, in terms of uh, those two separate home ranges in that migration period? What what is that uh, seasonality? I guess generally starts like late November is when we you first <clears throat> to start documenting it. Well, I would say peak migration is going to occur around December, January, and then February, March, starting to get to some of those uh, later migrants that are that heading out at the tail end of winter. This time. is in the in the state of South Dakota. Yeah, that'd be South Dakota. Yeah, South Dakota, North Dakota. Mm-hmm. Yep. Interesting. So if we're and those were those were those only too. So we didn't have any bucks collar. That's just doe movement. So in that case, though, there's no transition from a summer uh, core area to a fall core area. You're just looking at. We didn't, we didn't look at that. Uh, and we didn't, well, we didn't specifically ask that question. I don't think either of our grad students really found that either when they were looking at their data for the does. Well, we saw, you, you see a little bit more variation in the springtime when they're dropping fawns and they're mm-hmm. searching for habitat, but, um, that season or late summer to fall transition, we haven't really looked at that a whole lot with, uh, with our data. So it seems very, very specific to that winter migration, right? That winter yeah. transition. So that'd be interesting. I mean, because uh, again, I, you fully, or you at least observationally see a lot of times a doe moving to a particular spot when it's getting closer to the fawning aspect of things. And you see these doe family groups and stuff, but from a buck aspect, if it is purely nutritional, like if we're seeing that doe move in the winter time because of nutrition, logic would say that the bucks are likely doing the same thing. Yeah, you would, you would think so. Um, It'd be a really, really fun question to, to ask and look at here in the, the prairie region. Did it seem like food was the primary motivator for migration? That's what we're hypothesizing. That's what we think. Uh, so when I was at SDSU, there were two grad students working on their masters. They were, they were finishing things up. Um, and they were the ones I, I was using a lot of their data uh, in, in, in my analyses. And they would just anecdotally see, you know, hundreds of deer, a couple hundred deer in a sunflower field you know they, they'd see them all shipped to one area and that's i mean they were obviously honing in on on food but we haven't looked at that from a, a statistical standpoint yet mm. and i think that's kind of the bridge you know from an academic world to you know uh, there's a bridge from academic to state which obviously you've you've made that leap there's also that bridge and we talked about this with bronson from academic to the general hunting public right from from research that's being conducted and done and then how the general hunting public can understand that research and a, and a potentially apply it or at least use that research to manage their expectations. You know, and so if we're talking about winter migration there, and in particular, even if it starts in, you know, that November time period, you know, there's still some hunting to be had, you know, in November and December in these states that, you know, maybe deer are shifting completely out of the area. So it comes back that, you know, the question we always ask is, we think that no, that early November period is when we want to be out there, but are there some areas or states that would be better in October to really put a ton of hunting effort in, knowing that at least in my particular property, there's likely going to be some shifts happening after that that are going to decrease my chances. Yeah, I mean, my my opinion on that is the same thing I said to Bronson is like you got to get specific. Mm-hmm. Y- you know, you can look at um, general patterns of deer and stuff like that, but ultimately. Um, if the one deer is not doing, or he is doing what you think you're is, or is not doing, you know, mm-hmm. that's going to be what kills him. Not our deer migrating. Our deer migrating as a generally. whole. Generally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know one of the things that we talked about Eric before in, in terms of some of your current work, um, and, and obviously very applicable to a lot of farmland is you guys are starting to look a little deeper into how some of these agricultural practices, um, may or may not be affecting um, deer herds in an area. Um, and, and that's pretty evident in terms of some of the, the, the regions that we just talked about that are very ag based, which may be different than what we're, we have here in like Southwestern Pennsylvania, though there's some agriculture. 
I guess kind of give us a little bit of a synopsis there of, of what you guys are. First of all, what are you theorizing or wh what has prompted this, this potential um, research? And then let's kind of just see where it goes from there. Sure. So initially there is some research coming out, I think um, Wyoming or Montana. And basically uh, the scale is just measuring morphometrics of deer, right? Jawbone length, different skeletal measurements. Mm -hmm. And over time realized that there's more deformities that was occurring. And she hypothesized that this was being related to agricultural practices, specifically insecticides that were being used called neonicotinoids. Now we call them neonics for short, because that's obviously a, a mouthful to say every right. single time. But we're so, talking about an insecticide um, there, not like a herbicide yeah, or, or anything like that. Correct. Correct. So basically these neonics, they're applied, they're very wide used. They're widely used in agriculture. They're used in flea and tick collars for your pets. They're mm. used for home use. I mean, I think there's 500 products, registered products that are used in neonics. So it's not just agriculture, although we oftentimes, you know, relate it to agriculture, but they're, they're prevalent across the board. And so while I was at SDSU, they were working on um, research within their captive facility where they were actually dosing uh, specifically as imidacloprid, which is a specific type of, of neonic. Uh, They're dosing drinking water of deer with different concentrations of, of imidacloprid to just look at the response. And we had a control, like a, basically a low dose, a medium dose, and a high dose that we were giving these deer. Yeah. And at the end of the study, the grad student found essentially that above a certain level, we saw a decreased fawn survival. We saw increased lethargy with increasing levels of neonics. Uh, basically, the does were not getting up and moving as much. They weren't eating as frequently. Uh, we saw variation in uh, organ size, um, different morphometrics, things like that. So we saw some some negative effects with increasing um, levels of, of neonics in the drinking water. And we also found probably the most surprising thing was that our control group still had neonics present within them. So somehow environmentally, our control group was being contaminated, whether that was through the feed that we're feeding them. We had cornfields that were around uh, our, our deer pens there. Could have been runoff. It could have been several different things. We're, we're huh. not sure. So we were working with North Dakota uh, Game and Fish on this a little bit as well. And they had some spleen samples. So we, we found it specifically related to neonic levels within the spleen of a deer. That's where we found this relationship with all these different, different things. So we analyzed some spleen samples from uh, North Dakota, some opportunistic samples, essentially. And we found uh, evidence of neonics being found from deer in the Black Hills, from areas that you just wouldn't expect. You know, there's not a lot of air culture, so you wouldn't expect necessarily that you'd have these, these levels. We found it across the board. So literally, we got that that study published in, I think, March of 2019, which is the same month that I came over to the Minnesota DNR. And once I started here, I was approached about um, collaborating with some research here with our wildlife health program to look at the neonics, um, look at this issue here in Minnesota. So that's what we did. We basically partnered with our hunters. Uh, we took hunter collected samples in fall of 2019. They sent in their spleens. Um, we sent them off for analysis and we found um, found essentially widespread uh, evidence of neonics within our deer across the state, all the way up in the far northeastern part of the state where, again, agriculture is not, not uh, very prevalent up there, all the way down to the southwestern part of the state where we have a ton of agriculture. So widespread, uh, didn't really follow any of our hypotheses. We figured we'd have the highest concentrations in the farmland region, but that wasn't the case whatsoever. It was mm. across the board. So that's propelling us into putting out some grants for some different um, research that we're hopefully will get funded here in the next year or so, but that's where we're at right now. Were the levels of neonics that you found in these deer close <clears throat> or even remotely close to the level at which you started to see effects, um, you know, take yeah. place in your studies? Yep. They were. They, they were. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. So, yeah. I mean, like from a, from a agricultural sense, you know, we're looking at that insecticide from basically whether it's soybean, corn, sunflower, doesn't matter, you know, just to be able to control the, the potential damaging uh, effects of, of insects in those fields. Because they're obviously you mentioned, you know, pet control and stuff like that. They're so widely used. I mean, are there other things that maybe we're not paying attention to as especially get away from agriculture that potentially is containing these neonics that is why we're seeing it or that's why it's showing up in these, let's say forested regions, or like you mentioned the black Hills, like, yeah, there's not a ton of ag around there. Like what, how, how else could these might, you know, might these be, a, you know, appearing in these environments, I guess. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. There was a study that was recently, recently published out of Minnesota as well. And they were just looking for prevalence of neonics across the state and they found 
so obviously neonics is kind of like a blanket term. We have specific sure. neonics that are used for specific right. things um, within that. But they found different neonics uh, within the metro area. They found different neonics within urban areas. I mean, it was completely widespread, just different uses. So, I mean, when we start talking about things in a more urban um, suburban area, it could be easily just home use of insecticides. You know, it could be several, I guess several different things. I'm not familiar with all the different 500 sure. products, but I mean, there's, there's definitely home use products that could potentially be, be contributing to runoff and things like that. And that's how it ends up in water and well, ends I know, up downstream. But I know one of the things that we experienced, and I think you were, you were part of this, um, Eric, back in the day is like when we were down South, like oftentimes, and I didn't know this from being in the North, like there would be trucks that drove around spraying insecticides for like mosquitoes and stuff in the South and in certain <laughs> residential areas, like literally driving around with like a high volume mist thing. And, and in fact, we yep. talked about this not too long ago. And when we were doing research at the Mississippi State Deer Lab, you know, that was my first, it was 2012, uh, no, 2007, eight, um, when we had our first kind of experience around uh, EHD uh, and hemorrhagic disease. And so one of the things that we started to learn when we were talking about this was that, you know, essentially this biting midge and this colicoides uh, biting midge is what was transmitting this, this blue tongue or, or hemorrhagic disease, however you want to classify it. Um, in that we actually started to spray, uh, an ultra low volume, um, insecticide in the pens to try to control the colicoides midge, because effectively our, our research uh, deer were dying at such a high rate that like we were having bottlenecks in the populations that we were doing analysis on. So I, this is fairly new to us in terms of this is happening inside a controlled facility. Like how do we control this thing or what do we do? So there, there literally was a market, um, and, and Emily and I went and bought it. It was this, uh, ultra low volume mist sprayer that we put in the back of the mule, um, and would put a, basically like a permethrin, I guess, inside of that ultra level. And we would drive around the pens spraying and it, you know, it's hard to say that it actually worked. Like, is it a sponge effect to where you remove midges in this, this general area? And then, you know, immediately there's new ones coming in probably cause you're not going to control it at a landscape level, but it starts to make you think like, you know, does that right there potentially have an effect on, on the deer? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I hadn't really thought much about that either, but there's just, there's a lot of unknowns. This is all new territory for everybody. Sure. Um, so obviously we have the obligation if it is affecting bond survival or, or deer, our deer population. I mean, we're just investigating to kind of see what those effects are and then we'll go from there if that's the case. But it's it's pretty pretty much uncharted territory right now. And no, I, I hadn't thought about that. I've just tried to put those memories of getting <laughs> you know, blasted in the face with the spray out of my, you know, put those in the past. Yeah. Or, or Emily jabbing me with, uh, Tila's all sedatives to in my hand while I'm trying to control deer. It's probably going to have a, an effect at some point. Can deer get cancer? Is that like a thing that's documented or studied? Like tumors. They definitely can get tumors. Yeah. I was just curious, like, um, cause isn't there a lot of arguments for, um, people saying like glyphosate ca can cause cancer and stuff in humans? Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, we, we are familiar with this, um, discussion around these around chemicals at least, but mainly from a herbicide glyphosate, you know, roundup esque discussion. I think it's um, a more common application. There's a lot more people using herbicides than are using insecticides. I, I would argue. I mean, maybe not in terms of especially how, from a food plotting perspective. Yeah. Yeah. From a food plotting perspective, but Which then is again, a fraction of a fraction, you know, if it. I'm out there spraying off on myself to keep mosquitoes off, you know, is, is that potentially a, a neonic? Is that a product that potentially could be labeled as a neonic there? I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if they, I don't think they do, but I'd have to look at the label to can see we, what they actually have we, for us. Uh, what is the full, full term? I'm going to have you pull up the actual, the neonic neonicotinoids. Nicotinoids. Can you try to Google that? There's no way in hell he's spelling that. N-E-O-N-I-C-T-I-O-N-O-I-D-S. Nicotinoids. Sounds right. You're out. <laughs> Nicotinoids. I just want to read the definition. Could you use it in a sentence? <laughs> Jeremy swallowed a whole gallon of nicotinoids. <laughs> now he is dead. <laughs> Here, throw it up yeah, on the screen. Right. I'll read that it. That sounds right. And then I'm going to have you pull up. Yeah, there you go. Neonicotinoid. Yeah, systematic agricultural insecticide resembling nicotine. Hmm. 
Studies have found a link between neonicotinoids and it's gone off the screen and declining bee population. Well, that's an issue. I mean, when we start to talk about pollinators, um, obviously pollination, whether you're talking about agriculture, um, well, you know, fruit. Is it supposed to kill bugs? Well, yeah, I mean, bees, bees are bugs. But again, I think this is a really good, it, it's no different if we're talking about this and or herbicide and like, obviously these neonics are very, uh, they're affecting non-targets, right? Because effectively I, bees don't, yeah. are, are not something that they're trying to get rid of in an agricultural practice. In fact, it's, it's helping for pollination and things like that. When you talk about certain areas or certain farming, like fruit orchards and things like that. I mean, I'd assume if, if there's, um, suspicion that these are affecting deer, like certainly they're studying to see if they're affecting humans too, right? They're, yeah, they're in the very, very, uh, first stages of some of that research hmm. um there was a, a paper that was studied and i or that was published a year or two before we published our sdsu paper and i can't i can't remember the specifics but basically they were looking at neonic present uh, prevalence in, in newborns and i think it was they had increased prevalence in underweight newborns or something like that it was it was still pretty prevalent it was pretty crazy um, i mean any the, of the these thing about things me, yeah good well, I was just gonna say the the thing about neonics is, is they are a step up. They they are they are preferred to other insecticides because they're more specific in those chemical blockers, the neurological blockers, and they're not supposed to you know affect non-target species, particularly birds, mammals, things like gotcha. that. But more gotcha. and more research is finding that they are having some um, some effects. And and the thing about glyphosate Roundup and stuff like that, there's a paper that just came out that showed that the non-active ingredients in Roundup are still affecting pollinators because they, they had essentially, uh, and I haven't read the full study yet. It just came out, I think last week or two weeks ago, but basically they had, um, they used Roundup, they used Roundup without the additives or Roundup without the glyphosate and it's still related to those additives, the non-active chemicals in that Roundup that are having a negative effect on chemical or on, on uh, insects. So yeah. there's just a lot about this topic that we don't, we just don't know. Well, it's such an important topic because, I mean, um, yes, there are definitely some things around, you know, like everybody's talking about, what is it, the the cicada uh, hatch that's supposed to happen this year that's just like, you know, monumental. Really? Yeah. It's, Again? I feel like this is every it's year. It's like it's cicada, support. what is it, cicada 10 or cicada X or something like that. It's like the 19-year cycle or something like that. I feel like we, we hit a cycle yeah. every year at this point. Yeah, I don't Doesn't know. Doesn't it seem like two years ago? It does, I know. This is supposed to be the big one. It hasn't been Whatever. years. I'm only 28. But if you start to think about, like, and I get the damage that cicadas can cause. I get the damage when you start to talk about, like, um, specific caterpillars or, you know, tent worms or whatever you want to call them. But like when you start to think about the pollinator side of things, like obviously that is what makes the plant life cycle go round, you know, in most cases. And, yeah. and, and there's such a critical thing that when you start to talk about the, the honeybee populations and you start to talk about, you know, specific areas of, of other pollinators, you know, uh, I know a lot of people from a food plot standpoint are having some of their most successful food plots on a perennial side because they've got literally bee structures set up next to their food plots that promote the pollination you know, of those clover plots or whatever that might be. Um, and so you start to think about how this whole cycle works. And yeah, anytime you're going to use a chemical, whether it's a herbicide or insecticide, there's going to be some negative side effects. I just think that we've for so long turned a blind eye to what what it actually is affecting. You know, I mean, nobody, nobody probably before we literally have this podcast, besides in the scientific community, let's say from a general hunting public is going to say, Oh, you mean like those insecticides are affecting the deer on my property? They don't know. They're not thinking about that. You know, and it's, it's, I've, it's crossed my mind. Like when I spray, I see deer in my, when you spray glyphosate, when I spray glyphosate. When I, I see deer standing in that plot, I'm like, hmm, wonder how that affects them. Sure. Yeah. But I mean, I, I've also, though, like when looking at deer, my mind usually goes to things that I, I, again, I'm not a deer biologist. That's why I have you guys. Yeah. Is like I, I'm trying to look at things that I think are causing a more immediate threat, like the neighbors, <laughs> well, but, but also from, from that standpoint, like, um, like worms and, and ticks and stuff. Like mm -hmm. I would be more inclined to think like, man, is there a way to like, can we dose deer to prevent, you know, damage being caused by those things, which are, I think more, more prevalent. Probably. So, I mean, I think that goes to like, I know there have been studies, Eric, on a deer standpoint around, um, you know, applications, mainly to pen deer, but applications to deer for tick prevention for, you know, that's number one, right? Um, you know, I remember a study, I don't remember who did it, but like the deer would literally stick its head in to eat and it would apply like that 
that on like the back of the neck or something like that. almost like a frontline treatment, I guess is the best way to. Yeah. Explain. Yeah. I, I can't remember the specific studies. I, I wanted to say we saw a presentation on that deer study group at some point. Probably. Was yeah. Mississippi. Or was in Mississippi. But, and it was from a, it was uh, a I can't tick, remember the specifics. It was, I think from a tick control uh, aspect of it, you know, cause we're talking, yeah. uh, obviously Lyme disease is a hot button topic. Jared's had Lyme disease. I've had Lyme disease. Like, Everybody has Lyme disease. I've got to think. I've had Lyme disease. Everybody has Lyme disease. (laughs) I've got to think that deer probably have like a a stronger immunity to that. They're just built for living in the woods. Well, I think what's interesting though is like, again, and that is not something that's population applicable. Like you're not going to go around and paint every deer with some sort of quote unquote frontline treatment to prevent ticks on them and reduce Lyme disease at a landscape level. But the thought process is, is like even... Why like, not? I mean, if, how are you going to do it? How are you going to? Well, that's the question. If you could do it, like in just like in a, a mineral type of a setting, where you're not active application, but mm-hmm. something you can put out and the deer can, can consume at a portioned. Well, we've looked at that. I mean, we used to feed safeguard pellets, you know, the same stuff that a lot of cattle and stuff would get in our in our research pens from a worms aspect, internal worms aspect and stuff. But did it work? I don't know. I assume so. Yeah, it worked. I mean, looking at the. They don't have the, uh, the counts, the yeah. eggs per gram count. Yeah, like, they definitely went down. I, Has there I been a like study that was like, around that? Has anybody studied like if we give deer safeguard, do they get healthier and hence do the antlers get bigger? No, probably not. Maybe from a so. health from a health standpoint. I mean, if there's if there's less in theory, if there's less eggs in the count, then that deer's internal system should be healthier, right? More worms, more effect. That's a logical link, right? I mean, I had a conversation about this after uh, I presented some of my dissertation work at deer study group. And yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're essentially deworming deer, that's one less stressor mm-hmm. on them. And, and so logically you would, you, you would expect them to you know be healthier, grow larger antlers, but I don't think anybody's ever quantified it or looked at it in a controlled setting um, to, to get the results for that. That's crazy. Yeah. So when we, that's well, really crazy. Cause there's, full, there's like, there's, there's like uh, known industry brands that have come out with stuff like that. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, from a health standpoint. There are, but so like the, the question is, and this is just with any of this stuff, is like how is it certified and approved to be in the market? Like Safeguard, for instance, is like certified for what? Cattle, I think goats, maybe sheep. Um, Domestic animals, yeah. But it's not labeled for deer. Yeah. Right? So people use it in a research facility, in a pen facility, but – I don't think, I don't know what the legality would be, but I'm pretty sure you can't just go out and put safeguard in a bunch of pop, you know, feeders that you have out for wild deer. I don't know if there's regs around that. That's a USDA regulation, I would assume. Yeah, I'm not sure how that would work. I mean, it, again, it's probably not going to hurt them, but the product itself has not been produced, tested. Therefore, like if you shoot a deer and eat a deer that has been consuming safeguard, Something I just find something it, I find happen. it peculiar that nobody's done a study on if deworming deer improves their health and consequently their antler size. Well, I think it probably is around that like stressors. Like uh, I assume there's some link around. So we call um, what the uh, glucocolicoides from a stress standpoint. Um, yeah, cortisol levels, yep. the stress levels. Yeah. So yep. looking at feces, essentially, you can determine potential stress levels in deer. And there's been a ton of research around that. <laughs> like, oh, my God, this deer is so stressed out. Yeah. If it if it's <laughs> diarrhea, it's not good. <laughs> oh, <boy>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, that was part of my master's research is looking at fecal glucocorticoids and related to dominance uh, within our captive facility for, for deer there. Yeah. It shows for dominance as well. And- Sounds like a shitty job. You're like, this, <laughs> this deer's dominant. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the size Look of this, this thing. <laughs> Either that or he's been bound up for a while. Yeah. <laughs> it is it is funny though because you start to look this at this is either research. the herd buck here or he's got into a blueberry patch. But I mean it is <laughs> it is a big focus, right? I mean if you look at the stress levels that are being uh studied in feces, right? I mean that says a lot for deer. I mean the the higher those levels again, the more stress that happens, likely the more effects that you're seeing on a deer whether it's from body weight or and, at, you know, I assume some of that is from, you know, social stress, environmental stress, um, you know, and, and Can I just ask, what, what is it about the shit that is telling you that the deer is stressed out? I, I can't remember the actual lab protocol, but they can extract the uh, 
the actual cortisol glucocorticoid oh, so um, it's a density of a hormone out or yeah. hormone i see yeah. Yeah. and i can't remember if it's like the actual shed lining around uh the the feces or if it's something within the feces itself but it's That's yeah crazy. they can they're able to actually determine that so it's that, look at those that glucocorticoid is what they're looking at in terms of that being a varying level mm-hmm. you know and so glucocorticoid yeah and essentially that is the stressor or indicator of a stressor right i almost look at it as like a a ph type thing that off. right that and that off. essentially you know, it's not necessarily going to tell you that this is happening from a stress level in the deer, but it's an indicator that there yeah. is less or more stress happening sure. um, in that deer. And there's been a lot of research, I think, done around that side how of have, things. I'm sorry to go down this rabbit hole, but how have those been linked? Like, how, how did somebody look at and say, this level is extremely high, this deer is stressed out? It's a, it's a really, really good, uh, good question. So when we're looking at stress levels, it's what we call like a population level indicator right so it's all relative to the population that you're studying uh-huh. and it's relative to individuals within that population so there's no necessarily or there might be i'm not aware of it but you're like looking at baseline. things relative to each other right there's so no if, like uni- sure. universal baseline sure. that says deer above yeah. this threshold are stressed but what is it that's creating yeah. that link to say r- regardless of uh you know, in comparison to other herds, what is it that's saying like this level is high and that's indicating to us that this deer is stressed out? Cause it's a, is it a negative hormone that's produced in other ways that they're like, that's bad? Well, I think you're looking at it. I think what Eric's saying is you're looking at it within that population. So like if all the population is here, right. And that's, it's an arbitrary level, but all the population's here and these two deer are up here, then obviously they're more stressed for some reason. Why, why, how do you, why do you look at that and say it's stress as opposed to like, they're happy? It is a negative. Because those are, yeah, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, this uh, the the indicator of the actual stress hormones itself. So if you have increased, uh, I see. So it's just classified levels, as a stress hormone. The more stressed, stressed, out stressed out you are, the less happy you are. Gotcha. Yeah. So it's just common knowledge Basically. amongst deer biologists that this is a negative hormone. You yep. don't want them to have this yep. above a certain. They're going well, to it, have something. It, it's funny because stress to a certain extent can be positive, right? Like sure. if you talk about your fight or flight response, yeah. but the prolonged stress that becomes negative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, tell so me it, about it. it's, it's, a, it's pretty complicated when you start really. <laughs> Did you hear about my week? <laughs> I said, tell me about it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it is funny though. Cause you start to get down some of these, these different pieces. This is where, and I've, uh, you know, Eric, I think you and I've even talked about it when we were probably back in grad school. Like there's this definitive gap between things that are happening on a research and academic level and what the general hunting public hears. Mm -hmm. Right. And we, we beat the moon phase thing to death. All of academia. Yeah. Not just deer. Yeah. We, we beat the moon phase thing to death. So I won't go back down that. You know what's real fun? Just real quick. I did watch some team 200 stuff the other day. Yeah. It just, it's funny to see the complete opposite perspective. It's like ride or die. I know it's crazy, isn't it? Anyways. Yeah. So, I mean, that's where I get kind of frustrated is that, there are some good research. Now, the fact is, if we went out there and basically said, "Hey, we're a bit. we're out um, we're out uh, picking up deer poop in a pen and and testing it for stress levels," like the general hunting public is just like, "I don't know what that means," right? That they don't care. But you start to translate that, and some of it is going to be research based. Like, uh, you know, obviously, Eric, in your position from a from a research standpoint, what we're looking for is statistical differences. You know, we talked about this with Bronson and that. Like if there's not a statistical difference, research can't really say, eh, it is affecting or it isn't affecting. Just like when we talked about um, there were some deer movement increases with Bronson, he's like, it was like 50 yards. So though that may not be statistically different, they didn't move 50 yards different, or at least that's what the research said, but does that really matter at the end of the day? Probably not. I would assume not. I don't know. So still open on that. So that's where you start to go back to some of these things. And it's like, okay, how, what can we prove statistically from a research standpoint? We can say that there are statistical differences in these deer within this population and they're showing potentially greater stress, how that then affects them from a body weight or antler, who knows, right? That, that hasn't been looked at, but we know that it probably has some effect on it. Can't say statistically it does because either the data doesn't exist or it hasn't been you know analyzed yeah but from a logical standpoint which is how most of us have to think as hunters 
Okay. There's some negative effect, and I'm sure that if a deer is stressed out for a long period of time, he's probably not going to be body weight as big. And if it's during the antler growing season, he's probably going to have some sort of effect negatively on his antler growth. Can I prove that? No. It's just a logical connection. Mm -hmm. so. Some of the stuff is just so hard to look at. I mean, and this is kind of the beauty of the cap facility at Mississippi State and the few other universities that have cap facilities is you can control the stuff. You can look at an individual deer throughout its life. You can collect multiple samples off of it. Uh, I mean, you can really start to get at some of these nuanced questions that have a better idea of the links between things like stress and body growth or antler growth. It's just takes a lot of money and time to do it. And we start talking about it in a more free range wild population. It becomes very, very difficult or very, very expensive to do. So well, and just tough to get at some of these questions. And here's where like, obviously this is near and dear to both of our hearts in a weird way, Eric, but like the environment and genetics project at Mississippi state, right? Emily and I were there, we were kind of the second tier, Amy and Mike being the first tier and, and you guys being kind of the next guys to come in and, and wrap that thing up. I, I truly believe from a, um, and it's now looking back and a lot of it was talking to bronze. And so I, I, some of this may be a redundant thing for some of our listeners here, but, um, I think it would be interesting to hear kind of your take on stuff. But when we talk about these distinct regions of the coastal plain, you know, the Lurse region and then the Delta, it's, it's no surprise. I think to anybody that is familiar with the Mississippi or even the South, um, to say, oh yeah, Delta deer are bigger, right? The, the funny thing is, is I would say that prior to anybody, and, and you're still gonna have arguments about it, but prior to anybody understanding or hearing about the Environment and Genetics Project, the number one reason um, they would say that the deer are bigger in the Delta, just because of some lack of understanding, they would say it's genetics. There's just better genetics in the Delta, thus there's bigger deer. Secondarily to that would probably be, oh, look at all the ag in that area. There's a lot of ag in that area, so there's bigger antlers and bigger deer because of the food. I don't think that anybody then would have hypothesized outside of the research community that we could take deer, um, even if it's not in the first generation, from the coastal plain, and eventually they become as big as delta deer. And I think that, again, it's just a re-emphasize around managing expectations in, in your area. And, and what it is, and, and Jared and I have had this talk a lot, is there's some disappointment in it from a manager level when, I mean, listen, we, we probably spend more time managing for deer than we actually hunt deer. And doesn't matter what we do from a landscape level, our deer are what they are. Yes, there's some selective harvests we can do. Yes, there's some better habitat or better nutrition that we can have. Obviously, if we get them older, they get bigger. But if our deer are, if we have property in the coastal plain of Mississippi, there's no way we're gonna ever get those deer from a landscape wild level to look like Delta deer. It, we've shown in the research, at least it can happen, right? If we put them all in the same nutrition, um, we let them age the same and it's multiple generations of that, but from a manager's level, from a deer manager's level, the deer have the potential somewhere inside of them. It's just, they're never going to express it. Yeah. I mean, the amount of effort it would take for a manager to, to see that, the expression of that phenotype of the body and their increases in, the, in that. And those animals, it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot. And you have to have a lot of property because you're going to have immigration, emigration out of that population. And your buck fawns are going to disperse off. You're going to have other buck fawns dispersing on. So, I mean, it's, it, it would take a lot of effort, but it's also got to be somewhat hopeful to understand that if you do put in the effort, it just also just takes time. It's not going to sure. happen overnight. And it's not something that you can just do in one year and say, hey, this will be, you know, we'll be good next year. So I think if you can use that to manage your expectations, understand the amount of work and effort it's going to take to start moving the needle in that direction, and then just to be patient and give it time, I think there, you know, there can be a lot of uh, good that still comes out of it. But yeah, I mean, it's, it does take a lot of work and time. That's for sure. And I mean, obviously there are some um, nutritional limitations, especially when we talk about coastal deer to Delta deer and stuff, but going back to this kind of discussion of, of stressors and other things that are happening, you know, is it possible that some of the, the external stressors there are what is suppressing, um, what these coastal deer are expressing in terms of body weight and antler size, in your opinion? 
from a nutritional standpoint, I mean, you can look at nutrition in you know, a couple of different respects, obviously having a high quality diet allows you to express which the potential that you have. But if you don't have that, that, you know, looking for food is stressful. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that could in and of itself be a stressor to an animal. So if you don't have readily available food, you're constantly looking for food. You're trying to obtain enough food to uh, meet your daily metabolic limit. I mean, all those things culminate into stress, I guess is what I would, how I would put it. I mean, what would we classify as like hypothetically top stressors on a deer? Nutrition being one, right? Nutrition, um, uh, environment, weather, weather, predation, w- predation. So, I mean, again, let's shift that back up to where you guys are at in, in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Like, obviously, I don't know how it's been in the past couple of years, but you tend to get some pretty damn severe weather. In fact, I guess in the wintertime this past year, you guys had like negative 40 plus temps at one point in time. It, it got cold, but overall, we actually had a pretty mild winter. Um, it was definitely a relief for some of our northern uh, permanent areas to, to have you know, a uh, quote unquote mild winter, but yeah. then I think in February we had a couple of days where it got cold. cold. Well, and it's kind of, cool. it's crazy because that's one, I mean, I would assume Dakotas are in there too, but when you talk about Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, and the UP, especially like you guys literally have to take winter mortality into consideration. I would assume particularly when you start to talk about uh, harvest regulations and stuff. Yeah, that's a big uh, point of a conversation in our spring meetings. So part of my job here uh, also is to run our population model, come up with a, a density estimate and look at density trends across time to have an understanding of whether populations are increasing or decreasing. And I make a, a management recommendation. We have five different designations you can have for a permanent area in Minnesota, ranging from very conservative where it's only bucks, bucks only to uh, intensive, which would be a buck in I think two does. So uh, three deer limit. So we, we have to make those recommendations in the spring. Then we meet with our area managers and our region managers and our big game program supervisor. And we all discuss these recommendations and what's going on, what we're seeing with the population model, what managers are seeing uh, and hearing from the public. And then we, you know, discuss these different, different recommendations and then move them up the chain to be signed off on to go into law for the fall. And in those meetings, we talk a lot with our Northern permanent areas about winter severity. Mm -hmm. Um, we actually just revised part of our website to better discuss winter severity and how it's calculated and what it actually means and the complexities of winter severity and predation and all these different things that go into effect deer populations. Uh, because we have some permanent areas in the Northeast that just have not bounced back from 2013, 2014, when we had some pretty severe winters. And there's just a lot going on. Winter severity is part of that. Hmm. So, I mean, and obviously, I think we can say definitively your move from the academic world to the state world is uh, a big adjustment because now you're managing people populations too, right? The hunter expectations, what people are doing. So we talk about deer regulations in particular, and, you know, uh, let me not take this out of context, but, you know, a lot of hunters will be like, well, I can't believe they're telling me I can't go out and shoot a doe this year or whatever it is. You know, those are the discussions from a state level thing that, that tend to be the hot button uh, issues, right? Is that you guys are trying to use data, uh, and in this case, winter mortality to discuss what should be harvested in these areas. But ultimately the hunters just looking at it as you guys trying to manage them to tell them what they can and can't do. Yeah, it's definitely, it can be a challenge at times communicating what we're seeing. Our population model gets a lot of criticism and a lot of it's, you know, valid. Uh, it's not a end all be all to our, our deer herd, right? People see that deer density and they think, oh, 15 deer per square mile. There's no way I'm seeing that. Well, it's probably because there's not 15 deer per square mile there. It's just what the model's outputting. What sure. we're looking at is that trend across time. Right. And that's where you start to get into some disconnect about, you know, whether we have increasing populations or decreasing populations and how we're managing to get back to to goal. Uh, you know, every, well, the past couple of years, we've gone through the goal setting process where we actually take public input and try to get a better understanding of where people want the deer population to be relative to where it's at right now. And we're taking input from hunters. We're taking uh, input from uh, farmers and the egg side of things from general residents. Uh, all that kind of comes into how we're managing deer for the state of Minnesota. And mm-hmm. it can be pretty contentious for sure. In, in fairness, I think in some cases, like the model can only be as accurate as it is, I guess, specific. Yeah, data coming in. Yeah, because like even on our state of Ohio, yeah. like they'll tell us, well, you can only shoot, you know, two does per person. And it's like, 
that doesn't account for the fact that we have a thousand acres to hunt and way more than two does need to be shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, what, what, uh, data points are you taking in? Not to give a secret sauce away, but from your model, um, I, I guess is harvest data one of those. <clears throat> So, so first of all, everything that we do with our population models online, if you Google it, you'll find our modeling reports. Uh, so you can kind of dive into uh, more, some more of the intricacies of the model there. Mm -hmm. But um, harvest is the main driver. Mm -hmm. Essentially, what we have is a simulation model where we look at reproductive parameters, you know, how many uh, fawns are being produced per doe, mm -hmm. whether that's a mature doe or uh, a juvenile doe. Mm -hmm. Look at summer survival. Um, we use winter severity or winter severity index in there to adjust winter survival. We look at, um, what else do we look at? We look at sex ratios, all sorts of different things, sure. uh, fawn survival. I mean, all that stuff's going into the model, but where we, where we have issues is it's really hard to conduct research at the scale of each permit area right. to update these different numbers on an annual basis. And that's where we essentially have a simulation model where we update them when we have research that's being conducted. And then we look through the literature to update uh, if we can possibly update those, uh, those values going forward. So we're kind of in a transition. We're hoping to move to a different type of model. Uh, and to do that, we need to have a lot more data coming in to feed that model. Mm -hmm. How are you guys uh, doing uh, harvest, I guess, data collection right now? I, I know like in Pennsylvania, obviously you can go online and fill it out and you can do card, but I forget what the latest number is. You know, it's like 60% or something of, of deer are actually reported that were harvested type of thing. And then it's kind of you know, extrapolated based on that data. Do you guys have that same kind of system or are you doing like um, mandatory check stations? What is it in Minnesota? It's mandatory registration, but you can do it online. Um, you can, there are still, I think, some check stations you can take it to in person mm -hmm. and uh, you, so, or you can call in, I think, are the three main ways that people are registering their deer, but it is mandatory. Do you think that, uh, how much, how, what is your guesstimate of percentage that are actually doing it? I know it's mandatory, but Let's be honest, most people. Yeah, I, I think we have pretty good compliance. Some of our, um, it, it's hard to get at specific sure. numbers there. We do try to correct for the non-compliance within the population model, but mm -hmm. it's hard to put a, a real good, you know, get your thumb on what that number actually is. But I think we do have pretty high compliance overall. And I assume when you get into like the fawn survival side, now you're talking about the predation, which, you know, I know from my research that I did in Virginia, you know, black bears especially are, are a very heavy uh, predator on fawns uh, in certain areas and depending on what the densities and stuff are. But, you know, I know one of the things that's always a hot topic button up in your area is the wolves, right? And like how many, how many deer are wolves actually killing a year, whether that's from a fawn recruitment side or from an adult side. Um, and I know it's also a sensitive issue from a state level, but I mean, you know, I assume that's part of that adjustment when you're talking about the regions or certain regions that you're having to take those bear and wolf populations into effect where maybe other regions like the South, you, you don't. Yeah. So we have another research scientist, um, in our forested region and he's doing, um, he's doing some work right now and he's done a lot of long-term work looking at our populations, uh, and the response to winter severity and, and the wolf populations and, and survival and things like that. It's always a contentious topic. Uh, that's that's for sure. With wolves being federally federally regulated for so long, um, it, it's tough. I mean, wolves and, and predators eat deer. Yeah. You know, in the south, we don't have that same predator guild. We have coyotes. Coyotes eat deer. Yeah. That's not, that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. It's just can we better understand how that predation is affecting the population? Is it limiting population growth? Is it not having any effect on population growth at all? You know, where is our growth at? Where are survival rates at? Those are all questions that we're trying to ask and, and, and answer so we can better, better manage, manage deer in Minnesota. What yeah. about, um, this is maybe a uninformed question. I don't know. Do Amish, can they shoot as many deer as they want? Or do they abide by the same licensing tag system as we do? Mm -hmm. Statewide? That's a good question. I'm not sure. I'd have to look into that. I don't know if we have that's exceptions for that or not. So that's one, that's one that comes to mind, but it's, I have maybe a broader question. It would apply to probably like some native Indian tribes and stuff too. Like, are there populations of hunters that are not regulated within our permitting system? And I guess that probably is state by state. And are those accounted for in the recommendation for how many tags should be distributed? Sure. So we do work with our, our tribal biologists in Minnesota. Um, 
and they attend our, a lot of them attend our meetings and have input about how we're managing outside of, um, outside of those tribal lands. Uh, if they have harvest data, they provide that to us and we include that into the population model as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but they ultimately, you know, they're making a lot of their own um, mm-hmm. recommendations on their, their tribal lands for harvest, but they, they give us input and we'd have, you know, really high quality discussions about deer management at these meetings. Can you Google that? Interesting. I, I, Ian, try to find out if Amish, I would assume they have to apply, but maybe they have some special permit. Because there they, was at one point it's in a, time, su- it's a, they in, use that as a, to in Pennsylvania, there was some loose guidelines around that at one point. Because obviously we have a, you know, a really high Amish population here, as does Ohio. I'm going to guess they do. At least in Ohio, I do think they're supposed to abide by the seasonal guidelines and stuff. Yeah, that was seasonal my, guidelines. Like the season guidelines. No, I mean the actual number Harvest of tags and stuff. I bet not. You don't think so? No. Wow. I would assume not. Um, That's how you get me to convert. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just grow a beard. Um, y- you know, I think as you start to look at kind of some of the things that are occurring from a population standpoint, and you know, and how to kind of manage what what hunters are expecting or, or what they do kind of look at the ultimate thing is, and, and let's just focus on Minnesota here for a second. Like it is still producing some really big bucks. I mean, we were on the Boone and Crockett site the other day. Cause we're like, well, you know, what if we picked Wisconsin or Minnesota for a watch state? And I think both of them are listed in the top five for, um, Boone and Crockett entries, you know, and, and that to me is a very low barrier because obviously I know plenty of people that have killed Boone and Crockett deer and they didn't enter them. You know, they don't care. They're just like, yeah, I shot one and it was 180 inches. I don't know anybody that's ever entered. One. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that's a very low indicator on the, of how many entries and how many deer are killing. And, but you have these very concentrated, um, these concentrated areas. And, and so like when I look at that, there is, I can't remember what it actually is. There's a very large County in the North, east part i guess of minnesota uh maybe your largest county um and i think that that is tending to be where most of the boone and crockett type caliber deer are being killed um uh yeah i guess i'm not sure i've looked at the boone and crockett maps st uh, louis county is that is that right st louis county is yeah yeah yeah, that's that's, that is up in the north northeast um, that is the one so at least from a again I'm, What's I'm looking at areas north. Is that bordering one of the Great Lakes? Bordering Canada. Okay. Um, so I'm looking at that from a Boone and Crockett entry map. It's St. Louis County is the county per Boone and Crockett's data, which data is only as good as whatever you're getting in, um, that a lot of these Boone and Crockett deer are being killed. So I guess if you think about that area up there, is that is that more forested, like big timber type area? Yeah, and that's actually one of the the areas that we've had a hard time with populations recovering from some of these really severe winters. Yeah, um, so that, I, I mean, when I think about Minnesota and I think about big deer, <clears throat> I'm thinking mostly Southeastern Minnesota and the transition zone where you're, you have yep. more of that transitional area I'd between assume. agriculture and forest, but that doesn't necessarily surprise me either that if people are shooting big deer up there, they're, they're registering them. There's probably not as much like late winter food sources in that big wood setting. No, I, I would, would assume imagine. not at all. Well, I guess what I'm looking at is f- talking about these winter severities and pred- predators and stuff. And a lot of people will disagree with me. And, and I get it. Like, don't get me wrong. I love seeing deer when I'm in the tree stand, but ultimately I just need to see one. I just need to see the right deer. And so if you start to think about populations in, let's say, St. Louis County that maybe had some struggles of recovering from a winter mortality, um, there's probably a lower population of deer thus more resources for the deer that are there, less social stress, which is debatable of how that tends to affect buck body size and antler growth. But going back to the stressors, I would think that if there's a lower population of deer, the deer that are left there, given that they can hit the right age, have less stressors, thus could potentially achieve more of their potential. Yeah. And when we start talking about private lands and private land management in the Northeast too, it's, it's a little bit different when you have more control over how you're managing uh, the landscape compared to some of our public grounds. So mm-hmm. yeah, that would all make sense. Probably less, fra- uh, less fragmented as well. If there's less agriculture in that area, some more contiguous pieces of ground that would allow deer to potentially move and, and essentially quote unquote escape and get older age class animals. Is it, is it fair to say that, um, It's so weird. Like um, the, the tracts of land up there are, are bigger. 
or it's a lot of public big the hunting yeah, density big, uh, is like, oh, I guess gr- grounds up there. What I was going to say initially is like, is it fair to say that uh, humans have the biggest impact on um, whitetail populations hunt- and hunting pressure? Is that correct? Or Generally right? speaking, yeah. It is? Yeah. I guess the statement then is kind of like, you know, a five or six year old buck that is stressed out is going to have better antler potential than a two or three year old that's dead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, in theory of age, bigger antlers versus hunting pressure. It just seems like because if you literally look even from Pennsylvania to mm-hmm. Ohio, where I'm at, the tracts of land are bigger. And that's about the only thing that's different. But I think that track of land size determines hunter density and, and its impact on herds. I think we have that conversation a lot in terms of thinking about. Um, and the deer are bigger was going to be. My yeah, answer. deer area. Like, for instance. If I look at um, the Pittsburgh area or even probably the Minneapolis area, there may be a, call it, let's say it's 30 deer per square mile, right? But really, the deer in that area are condensed to a few hundred acres maybe at the most because of how urbanized or suburbanized it is, right? There's less deer habitat for the number of deer to occupy Mm -hmm. versus as you get to maybe those northeastern parts of Minnesota, or we think about Kansas, uh, think about the Dakotas, where it's just vast amounts of land. There are less deer in that area, but it's because they have so much more room to occupy. Mm -hmm. In a lot of these places, you know, think about that northeastern part of Illinois, which is not far from Chicago, um, or northwestern part of Illinois, not far from Chicago. There's not a whole lot of area for those deer to occupy because it is suburban America um, versus like as we get to these bigger pieces of ground in northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, the UP of Michigan, you may not see as many deer, but it doesn't mean that the actual number of deer are less. It's just they have more area to cover in theory. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, your observability definitely goes down when there's increased hiding cover and sure. just increased ground for them to go. Uh, definitely, definitely. I think about that sense, even in Pittsburgh. Sure. I mean, you drive drive into Pittsburgh, like if you're going to Page Dairy Mart, you're driving to Pittsburgh, you're like, oh, there's 10 deer bedded along this hillside in the wintertime, mm-hmm. right? Do that same thing out in Kansas, and it's like there's two a mile later, there's two more. The same amount of deer maybe are in that county, but it's just they have so much more room to go. Yep. and move yep. and, and a, there's an attractive to the to that because we've talked about the dakotas like where can we go to kill bigger bucks first thing you got to do is find where there are there are deer that can reach four five six years of age i like can you kill a big three-year-old for sure you kill 150 plus inch three-year-old mm-hmm. but for the most part if i want to kill 150 plus inch deer he needs to be four five six years old mm-hmm. so you got to find a place that a deer a buck can actually live to that age then you have to adjust and say, okay, what's my access to the place? Is it all private? Is there big public tracks? And then think about at what point in time during that season, is it going to get pressure? Like we just talked to guys in Southern Illinois who said, yeah, you're going to see a ton of deer, uh, especially during bow season. But the moment gun season opens, every corner of every field has an orange suit in it. And like, it doesn't mean they're going to kill every deer, but they're going to put so much pressure on those deer that they're going to lock down. They're going to find the places that they can escape and lock down And I think when you start to talk about uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, the amount of hunters, deer hunters in those state is immense. Now, I would say most of those people are are gun hunters, um, but still, it's the amount of hunting pressure you have in those areas is going to prevent um, a lot of deer from being able to reach that quote unquote big potential. Um, Now, do you guys have harvest restrictions in Minnesota too? For antler restrictions? For, for antler restrictions, we used to in the southeastern part of the state, but we don't anymore, um, mainly due to CWD uh, mm-hmm. being prevalent in the southeast. and whole other yeah, factor so to we, manage for. Oh, yep. <laughs> yep it's a, that throws a whole other wrench into the game for well, sure. And I think this is a really cool, uh, you know, let's talk needle in the haystack, right? Uh, here's Eric, a deer biologist who harvested deer in Wisconsin that ultimately tests positive for CWD. Yeah. Yep. So moved up to South Dakota from Mississippi. Uh, Brookings was about seven hours from my parents' place. So I made several trips home to hunt. Like Jeremy had alluded to earlier, you know, you break that cycle of going home to hunt every, every year. 
as soon as I got it to within driving distance, I made it back as much as I possibly could. Uh, so that first fall back, I ended up shooting a deer. And in the county that my parents' place is in, it was start, you know, CWD, the prevalence rates were starting to creep up a little bit, but we had not detected CWD on my parents' farm yet. I don't even know that we necessarily had detection on, you know, the surrounding farms. And I shot that buck, perfectly healthy, healthy looking deer. I, he ended up being a two and a half year old eight pointer. I think he, uh, field dress, he's like 180, 190 pounds. I mean, he was just a big body deer. <laughs> and I just had a bad feeling about it. Just thinking this would be my luck, right? Come home, finally get to bow hunt at my mom and dad's place again. I'm going to kill a deer and it's going to be a CWD positive deer. And it was, it turned out that that animal was CWD positive. Um, yeah. So then I had to go through the whole, you know, what do I do with this? You know, mm -hmm. do I eat the meat? Do I dispose of the meat? I mean, how does this change hunting on my parents' place? I ended up writing an article for it for quality whitetails about just the mindset and the process that I had to go through as a hunter and as a deer biologist and having probably a little bit better understanding of CWD and, and its impacts uh, and, and things like that than the general hunting public. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was, it was a big deal. I mean, what, um, so, and that was, that was a few years ago. So what have you seen or have you seen anything change on your parents' farm since that, since shooting that deer? I mean, have you seen anything, what you would call, I guess, observation data more, whether it's trail cameras or, or actual hunting scenarios? So that, that's kind of a, that's a great question. I haven't seen really any, any changes from our trail cameras from, uh, you know, talking to, uh, friends and buddies that still go back and hunt my parents' place, they're still seeing a lot of deer. And that's where we have this disconnect with CWD and, and deer hunters because it's not a fast acting disease. Mm -hmm. You know, within the first couple of years that I came back up north, I think it's something like 50% of the deer that we were shooting was they were testing positive for CWD. And I mean, we're very small sample sizes here. We're talking about like seven or eight deer total across a couple of years. But still, I mean, that's a pretty high prevalence rate. Sure. And that's the prevalence rate for that county is right around 50%. But you don't see that translate into decreased deer populations or decreased the size of bucks because it's it's such a slow acting disease. I mean, we're talking about a disease that can incubate for 16, 18 months. But once uh, those animals become symptomatic, they deteriorate very, very quickly. Hmm. I mean, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence that you'll see a buck at the end of the antler growing season in August that's still full velvet, but it's just skin and bones and they test positive for CWD. So the fact that, uh, you know, these deer are still really have big sets of antlers is, is telling me that this disease doesn't have much of an impact while it's incubating. You know, they, they aren't, you know, incurring these stressors that we just talked about. They're still right. able to grow a pretty large set of antlers, but once it becomes active and these animals become symptomatic, they, they go fast. Have you considered making all of your deer wear masks? <laughs> <laughs> Don't know that I would help in our situation, but yeah. You know, testing them. yeah. Only the Pennsylvania governor will tell you that. Um, well, cool, man. Listen, Eric, we, uh, we know you're on a tight timeline this morning. We appreciate you coming on to the Hunter podcast. I think that, um, one thing that would be interesting kind of as you continue to do some research there in, in Minnesota is to keep us in the loop on stuff. I think it'd be really cool to have the, the, the listeners have you back on, you know, sometime, maybe even this fall as it gets closer to hunting season to talk about some of the updates on the projects. I think this insecticide, um, conversation, you know, ties right into what everybody's talking about with herbicides and stuff. And, you know, it would be a really interesting, um, topic to can continue to expand on. I mean, the fact is anything that is potentially negatively affecting not just deer, but all wildlife populations that, you know, maybe some of us are using, um, and don't even know it, uh, it's just an awareness issue, right. That, that tends to continue to arise. And so I think keeping us updated on that and some of the other projects, I think from being such a deer hunting tradition, rich state in Minnesota, and obviously your connections to Wisconsin, you know, we would love to, to get you back on and, and, you know, talk about some of the stuff that's happening even during the season, whether it's a CWD conversation or, um, you know, improvements on population modeling and, and how those kind of discussions happen. I think it'd be a, a cool thing for people to hear. Absolutely. I appreciate you guys having me on and yeah, I've, we got quite a few projects right now in the mix that we haven't even, even touched. So we have plenty of material to, to cover if you want to. So anytime I'd be happy to be back. Awesome. Sounds good, man. We appreciate you having on. Uh, tell Sabrina and the family I said hi and and hope your little man feels better. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I hear him running around, so I'm sure he's turning the corner. There you go, man. It was nice to meet you, man. See you, buddy. Right. Soon. Take care. See we'll see you. Did All you right. find anything about um, 
Amish licenses and stuff. Otherwise, the Amish police will get him. <laughs> clap, 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 clap. Oh, that was. <laughs> yeah. I. Uh, who knows? I mean, uh, obviously, I know from. Uh, is it well, first? We know some. A bunch of my neighbors are. We can ask. I'll ask them. Yeah. Curious. Cool stuff, though. I mean, you start to think about the. I mean, there's only so much you can control, but. Yeah, I mean, you think about these big agricultural practices, and and obviously these guys are running a business. You know, they're trying to maximize their yield, um, which you know, farmers in the U.S. already have a tough tough gig. But yeah, starting to think about some of these other aspects of it, like you know, whether it's herbicides or insecticides and and the neonics that Eric had kind of talked about. But you know, those are things that we never, I, I guess, two prong. Number one, you never think about it from a like, hey, how is this really affecting? non-targets like if i'm spraying an insecticide how's this thing affecting deer or turkey or whatever um but the other angle is like think about the number of new hunters and people exploring hunting that's happening from a sustainable eating side and now you're thinking about well you know how is this insecticide effective in this deer that i'm a pen- potentially trying to go out and harvest to then consume because that i think this is sustainable you know in organic um, it's a weird thing because we're very critical, I would say, of a lot of the foods that we eat that come through from a USDA managed process of what we pick out in the grocery store. But when you start to think about wildlife, like I, I love eating venison, you know, it's, it's something I do probably three to five times a week, you know, and I love it that it's sustainable and organic, but then how is this stuff affecting it? And is this involved, like, is this in the meat process? And especially because it isn't USDA regulated, unlike, you know, beef cattle or pigs or whatever, you know, wild deer populations and venison, unless in a, in a closed facility, um, is not regulated by the SDA, USDA. So it's, there is no standard, I guess. And so, like, how does this stuff potentially negative affect the venison that we're consuming? Yeah. You know, and is it affecting there's de- the there's venison There's definitely we're some kind of contaminants happening there. Like, maybe not to a level that's noticeable or even harmful, but mm-hmm. I think their study of what they were finding from deer in the Black Hills and stuff where there's no ag is that, and I'm personally of the, or I agree with the opinion that there's not really any, there's no such thing as or, organic anymore. Like mm-hmm. Some things... It, contaminating yeah. everything it's like once it's introduced to the environment it's you know whether it's the wind just the atmosphere sure. birds bees whatever it is that's causing the well we always joke spread. that like fish aren't deer deer aren't fish of course but if you think about like when like if you and your you and your dad went up to lake erie and were fishing you know one of the things to be concerned with a lot of w- fish there is the mercury levels right and you're recommended to only eat so much fish from those places it's over like a certain period one, of time yeah, like one fish a week or something yeah and so like is that some and again you know people are looking at that but i don't think anybody's looking at it from a venison side uh, yeah. on a deer hunting angle and maybe we should like maybe we should or somebody should be looking at the fact that hey we took samples of these deer now i know eric's talking about the spleen and to my knowledge nobody <coughs> eats the spleen unless it's yeah, I don't think anybody needs explain. Um, but like, how does that af- protect, potentially affect the meat? Um, you know, and are we testing anything? Is anyone testing that? I would assume not. You know, and maybe that's a research project somebody should be doing. Talk yeah. to our game commission friends about it. Yeah. Hey, did you ever hear of Neonix? Yeah, that'd be interesting. I don't know. Like I, I've definitely eaten venison, and I'm not like concerned with it. Like I, no, I would eat. One. Even I still eat three to five it. times a week. I had it last night. I have it for lunch. Yeah. Got venison fajitas. Actually, but at the same call time, my name. At the same time, if you ask me, like, if, if I would prefer to eat a deer that was killed, like, in the outskirts of Pittsburgh versus one that was killed, like, in the middle of nowhere in North Dakota, like, I, I feel, I think I would pick that one just because of like exposure to black lung. Yeah. <laughs> d- well, just like. You know, chemicals that humans introduce yeah. into the atmosphere. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying in terms of like, just think about. So let's take that deer in the the Pittsburgh city limits. Like, you've got people treating their lawns with stuff. You got yeah. people probably putting off some sort of insecticide bug bomb because they don't want gnats and mosquitoes around. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got runoff. A lot of these happening. people are probably eating gardens that people are spraying with insecticides For or sure. herbicides. You got runoff from all the factories and the waterways. I mean, half the waters look like, you know bright red, you know, creeks. So like, 
there's definitely some sort of an effect that's happening on those deer. But again, I don't think anybody's looking at that stuff, mm-hmm. you know, and maybe there, maybe it's because there's nothing to worry about. Like, it, Hey, listen, it's the meat. Like, don't worry about it. It's processed through the body, but I have to affect, like, it definitely has some effect because we are very stringent on the USDA cattle process, the beef profit process, especially and same with poultry and pork. Yeah. Like we're so <clears throat> scrutinized on those areas. I would think that, you know, for the amount of people that are consuming venison, especially some of these donation programs, yeah. like you're giving a family venison, like should, should they be concerned that their kids are eating it? I don't know. I mean, I'm not, my kids are eating it and, and they, <laughs> they look fine. Yeah, they're fine. You know, a little bit <laughs> wacky every once in a while, but yeah. you know, it's just genes. Uh-huh. Yeah. I don't know. It, it, it brings up interesting questions because I will say when I'm spraying something, you know, that, that's kind of what I like about the deer grow side because it is an organic spray. Like it, it's not, there isn't anything in there, but like if I'm doing glyphosate, yeah, I wonder like, what if I spray this field with glyphosate and then deer come through and eat that? Like that can't be good. Mm-mm. Like it, do they know not to eat it? I don't know. I've seen them no. in the field eating like right away. Yeah, they definitely so, do. So like somehow they were having to metabolize those chemicals out of them, whether it's an insecticide or a herbicide, and it can't be good. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't feel I like... I always we, like to t- taste my Roundup just to make sure it's strong enough. <laughs> yeah, that'll do. But I mean, think, uh, think about, like, on the cattle end of things. Like, it's not like... Uh, so your family's been in beef cattle for a long time. It's not like somebody's going to go out and spray an active patch, pasture with glyphosate and then let their cows go in and graze on that. Mm-mm. Not within, like, a certain window. They will put animals out into crops that have been, like, sprayed, but then later harvested. Yeah. And stuff. But not like I sprayed it, yeah. then I turned them out in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, they'd probably just try to avoid the direct consumption of, like, mm-hmm. most concentrated chemical, if possible. Yeah, I mean... Makes you think. I mean, not saying that it's going to affect anything, you know, but like it does make you it's think. It's probably about one of those consuming. things like where people don't think that there's a lot of cross contamination happening. And then you take like a black light to it. It's like, oh, oh, yeah, oh, it's, it's everywhere. It's, glowing. it's yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it, that's where like, and it's not to beat up on these people, but if, you, if there is a trend that is growing from our community that is very like um, wild game focused, right? And I love that because again, I'll, I eat deer meat three to five times a week. As, as long as I have it till the freezer is empty. But there's this like weird push of it. it's so sustainable. It's very organic. And it's like, no, dude, like that deer was just eating off of a chemically well, sprayed. It probably field. is still better because I think that. Yeah, um, I would assume so. Like a processed animal is still consuming the same stuff, but then it's potentially injected with something or it's, yeah, it's hor- enhanced hormones. Some way. And so they like have that. a baseline of this, like what a deer would be consuming. Um, but it's just, it's only that Yeah, it's void of whatever is introduced. Well, I just, I guess I look at it from the ground level up, no pun intended, but think about vegetables. There are a certain amount of vegetables that are able to be labeled as organic in a grocery store because of what they're sprayed from. Yeah. If a deer is eating from vegetables and or plants, soybeans, corn, et cetera, that are not labeled organic, like there is some contamination happening probably Mm -hmm. thought process. I don't know, but it's definitely, uh, you know, it's cool to see again. I don't know if anybody would have known that Eric and the Minnesota DNR are even looking at this had there not be the Hunter podcast. Yeah. Um, but no, seriously, that bridge from research to academia, we talked about it, um, to, to the actual hunting public side of things is, is, really wide and i know bronson and mississippi state deer lab as well as uh dr craig harper at tennessee and carl miller in georgia like a lot of these guys have done a better job at that but it's still a big big gap and it's like you know if there's one thing that we can focus on here at and the hunter podcast at some point is how do we bring the light a lot of this research that's happening to the public Mm -hmm. like hey guys people are looking at this you know and or what do you think they should be looking at? I think it's fun to try to bridge the gap because, like, I'm an idiot as far as, like, these well, no, you're these studies and stuff. But, like, what the perspective that we can bring is, like, we are hunting, like, yes. in the field. And, and so we're just bringing our experiences in the field to, like, what these are guys are saying at a, you know, big picture study level and saying, okay, I've seen some of this. No, I haven't really seen any of that. 
Mm -hmm. Um, But I think we'll probably be more aware as we go into, you know, trying to manage our deer herds or, you know, hunt certain populations of of animals about some of the stuff we've talked about so far. The stressor side is a real um, factor that I've been very interested in for two things. Number one is I am a firm believer that social social stress has an effect on deer antler and body size. Mm-hmm. That if there are a pow deer in a very tight area, that social stress interacting with other deer and other bucks as tes- testosterone levels rise negatively affect deer either that season in terms of their growth and or in subsequent seasons. In that same breath, you think like literally just the stress, not hundred percent, not the lack of food or nutrition. Well, we talked or about with Bronson, like even. I mean, the fact that there, if there's more mature bucks in an area and there's more intense fighting over does for those r- limited resources, you know, we've got brain abscesses that can happen, injuries during fights. Like there is, a, it takes effort, a lot of effort and energy to have those fights. Mm-hmm. So whether it it may not affect the deer's antler size that year because it's already established, but I think in subsequent years, it'll absolutely have a negative effect. Mm-hmm. Do I have research to prove that? No. But I think that that negative stress affects them. Environmental, nutritional stress. We know nutrition. Like if there is a lack of nutrition, we talked about it in the Dakotas. If we continue, which hopefully we got rain, if we continue to experience a drought in the Dakotas, the antler size and body size of those deer will decrease this year. It's a proven fact. Because nutrition is limited, thus extra stress on those deer, water is limited, it, it affects them negatively. Yeah. So I think as we look at these kind of factors that are happening, it's like, man, if I'm managing my property from a habitat standpoint, and this is one thing I always really put a big emphasis on when I work with private landowners, I'm managing my property from a habitat aspect to make sure I have the best habitat. If you do not manage your deer population in the same effort or level of intensity, you're not going to get a benefit out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something to be said for like you have to take it from the top down in terms of the things that are most directly affecting your your herd. And so like for me, it's neighbors. It's way more than like insecticides. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know, so while it's an interesting conversation to have, it's like. You know, maybe I should be putting some neonecticides in my neighbor's water supply. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's where my head's at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is. But that is that is the limiting factor on your farm, mm-hmm. right, is the hunting pressure around is preventing your deer from reaching their full potential because they're getting killed at two and three years old. Mm-hmm. You know, as is a lot of cases for people. <clears throat> Whereas maybe on the mountain, I'm not having that much, though they do kill a bunch of deer. It's more of I don't have any crops like i don't i've i've got a stressor of food at some parts of the year for sure Mm -hmm. so yeah i mean it it comes in as there's so many factors that go in to try to grow big deer and hunt big deer you know it's not just luck of actually hunting them i mean again beat this thing probably every freaking podcast we have but like can't kill big deer if he's not there it takes a lot to grow a big buck you know and and there are just some areas dakotas kansas iowa that they're just better at it, mm-hmm. better at growing bigger bucks than we are mm-hmm. in Southwest Pennsylvania. Or, you know. I think that land track size has a ton to do with it. I think it, that directly yeah. correlates with hunter pressure in a lot of cases. I think it also correlates with deer social stress. If there's more space, the deer aren't having to in- interact as much. It may or it may not, d- just depending on the landscape. I don't think it's a direct correlation but I think what you're saying is valid also. I th- I would say like literally from a hunter standpoint you're saying. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Which I think is I'm saying, which we established is the biggest yeah. factor. I'm saying from a deer standpoint, if deer have more area within a 1 square mile that is deer habitat that they can occupy, they will have less social stress because they don't have to be jammed into a 5 acre block of woods in the Pittsburgh outskirts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's all linked, man. I mean, ultimately, it's all all tied together, but it, it starts to paint the picture. Like, as we are discussing, like, hey, here's where we want to hunt, like we talk about Wisconsin and Minnesota. It sounds like there's some places that have some potential that if it checks the box of it's got bigger tracts of land, potentially good habitat and food, and at some point, there always will be hunting pressure, but maybe lower hunting pressure during bow season. That seems like the key recipe to well, the, the two are, the two are I, what I'm saying is connected. the The bigger tracts of land, the lower the hunting pressure. Hundred percent. Period. Yes, no doubt. And I think you see that in Oklahoma, Kansas, Iowa. 
northern Minnesota, even Ohio, northern Wisconsin, it's kind of like the most yeah. close to home here. Like you look way better. Or even, dude, here in Uniontown, as opposed to up on the mountain where you've got a big track of land, there's a big deer that lives there. Big there's deer. not one that lives here that I mean that you know of. Yeah. And if there is, he's there's probably a lot more people hunting him. A lot of, probably a lot more people know about him. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the kind of thing that we're going to have to start looking at. Um, even when we go into our southern Illinois, that's not a very dense area. There's few and far between people, mm-hmm. um, less populous counties, I should say, mm-hmm. versus if we're in Columbus, Ohio, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Yeah. A lot higher people, more pressure, have a bigger time, a harder time killing a big deer. Mm-hmm. They exist, but I think that. You know, well, our goal here is to try to put this recipe together. Like, how do we, and, and killing it's one thing, right? But, man, just put us in the game. Yeah. How do we get into a county on a piece of tra- dirt that literally has a big buck on it to kill it? At that point, you're in the game. Whether you kill them or not, it's on you usually, and a lot of luck. But uh, Yeah, it's fun. It's kind of, it's a weird comparison. It's kind of like digital marketing or what it was like a couple of years ago anyways was ultimate it just came down to like creativity because mm-hmm. there's people scooping up the biggest mm-hmm. pieces of the pie we talk about outfitters mm-hmm. you know leases of which you know we partake in some cases mm-hmm. um and private permission i think gets a lot of first dibs so now we're sitting here as non-residents of a lot of these states who aren't going with an outfitter who in some cases aren't we don't have leases uh, but we're still trying to figure out how to get access to pieces of ground to kill big deer and it's fun. I mean, it's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're struggling at it, obviously. You know, in, I think in, a lot of people in some of these states, it. but I think we're going to get into some. Like, I, 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 as much as it sucks that we didn't draw in Kansas, um, like we know that Kansas is good. And it will, it, I mean, maybe not always, but it'll be there. Yeah. I mean, barring that the tags are always regulated, I think it will be good. Um, Which obviously they are and probably will be more and more. So that's why I'm excited about kind of being forced into the, opportunity or the situation in illinois where we got to explore we're gonna have to figure it out well, and i think we've had we have a good trend here i mean um we've got dakotas which likely we will not have north dakota next year maybe but likely not we'll have it this year don't have kansas this year well and dude if we can establish landowner connections in south dakota you know may, yep. maybe a non-issue we will have kansas in 2022 we will have a preference point it's almost a guarantee at that point then we'll have iowa the next year we'll have iowa the next year so, I mean, yeah, it starts to set up. I mean, we listen, at the end of the day, you have to just get out there and, and explore and take risk, and you're going to fail. You're going to get into an area where you're like, man, can't believe there hasn't been a buck bigger than 140. It's like, yeah, a 148 point at five years old is probably an average buck in that area. The fact that you don't have that outlier that's 150 plus, sorry. Mm-hmm. You know, you just you, it doesn't have all the, the dynamics to create that. Mm-hmm. There'll be other places that you'll put up a camera and get two 160s. Just has the has the mindset. But I think it, as we start to look at these kind of watch-based areas, we know where there are the best encounter possibilities. Kansas, Iowa. We have to start to look at where else in states that, again, number one state producing Boone and Crockett whitetails, Wisconsin. Also one of the top hunting pressure states in the country so there's some we should hit them up see, see where this tracks out in wisconsin see what that see what that's about i, I want to circle back to on was it the um was it the most recent uh wisconsin hunt that the hunting public put up that you guys were referencing the last time where, where jake went and was hunting with his family yes yeah it, it was interesting to watch you watch the gun season one? Watched it yesterday. It's wild, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It was funny to like gun ha- season's have, just a different It was piece. funny to have gotten your perspective on it before I ever saw it. Yeah. Because it was pretty cringy for me. It was hard to watch. I figured it would be. I was like, I kind of grew up with that though. Like well, I grew up I mean I bow hunted, but I grew up with opening day yeah. of gun season, fifteen so guys in a camp. Maybe not fifteen, but I can see the perspective. I understand why it was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And I understand why it's it's a cultural thing too. Yep. Yeah, I can definitely under I can relate. I can be like, man, that would be just a blast. But I'm also thinking about, you know, the guy that's been bow hunting that piece of public for the whole season and maybe passed on those deer three, four times already. Yeah, and like eight and of them just like, died. Sucks for that guy. 
Yeah, it does. It's it is, and that's a, usually me. I'm usually it's that a guy. dynamic. <laughs> well, and that's where like the managing expectation comes harder. And we we've talked about this even on your property. I mean, there was a point where it was like, listen, I don't want to kill Buck until he's five on your property. You still want to kill a five year old? Odds are he ain't getting there. Mm -hmm. I get it. I mean, I wish everybody could have that. I wish Jake and his family could go and do that and just mm -hmm. have a blast doing it. And I also wish the guy that's been passing on his deer all year long was getting deer through. I wish that could happen for mm -hmm. everybody. But mm -hmm. that's just the conflicting goals of a shared conflicting resource. Conflicting goals of the about. shared resource. That's a big, I mean, that's that's everywhere, right? I mean, there are a lot of deer that I didn't even hunt up on the mountain this year. And I'm like, man, I can't wait to see that deer next. He's dead. Yeah, dude, <laughs> even like the Amish in my neck, was, I wish they could like bring their whole family in and just mow them down. I wish, I I hope that that sounds great. I also wish that I could have a bunch of five and six year old bucks constantly, but the, yeah. the two just don't, they don't add up. They don't add up. Well, and that's where like from a, um, this is a big conversation. I'd, I'd love to, and I think we will, I mean, just for everybody listening, we're, we're working on a partnership with Pennsylvania game commission to, to get these guys involved on the hunter podcast. Um, the, every state has a goal in mind. And most of those goals are catch per unit effort. CPUE is basically what it's referred to. And that, that is simply they want to maximize the amount of harvest for the hunting public. That is the goal. And CPUE is usually used on a fishing side. Like, you know, we put trout in a creek because we just want to increase the amount of catches per fisherman. Mm -hmm. Most state deer management programs are set up on a CPUE basically saying we want to increase the amount of harvest opportunities for our hunters. <clears throat> what they're not set up to do, and, and one of the few I think it is, is like most places in Texas, is to manage for big bucks. Yeah, what type of hunting opportunities or harvest opportunities? Just a harvest. That's it. Harvest opportunity, period. Yeah. Pennsylvania took a step, as, as did some other states, when they put antler restrictions in place because that CPUE went away a little bit and focused more on let's get bucks to two years and older. But it wasn't so much that as it much was like, we need to reduce our doe populations because mm -hmm. populations are getting out of line. Habitats are getting destroyed. We need to, so if we block people from shooting one euro bucks in theory, they'll shoot does as well or more frequent does, thus bringing our doe population down. Why is that the... Is that because it brings money into the state that that I think is it's, the goal? I think if you look at license sales, and I'm hoping that we get Matt Moret from the, the Pennsylvania Game Commission in here to talk about this, but, you know, these the, the lifelines for a lot of these states is license sales. Yeah, because you would think from a, a biologist standpoint, their main objective should or would be, you know, to make the herd as healthy as possible, flourish. And that doesn't necessarily line up with as many hunter opportunities as possible. Yeah, define health, health of like the herd in general. And really, I think Pennsylvania manages on a health of habitat over health of herd in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because the Game Commission doesn't manage most of the timber the DCNR does, which is a whole separate agency. In the case of Minnesota, where Eric's at, DNR manages both forestry and, and wildlife populations, which is how it should be. Um, but I think it, it's an interesting discussion because – these states are definitely managing for harvest opportunities, period. With license sales being, uh, and there's a lot of factors go in because then you talk about um, Pittman-Robertson Act and, and how money's brought in via ammunition, gun sales, hunting equipment sales, and things like that. Also based on uh, access, so public land, um, available acreage for, for recreating in the state, as well as like I think number of license sales. But all of those things combined end up bringing in federal dollars in addition to the state license funds that are generated. So if you start to think about it, it's like, okay, in theory, I could bring in the same amount of license dollars, but it'd be from a lot less people if I said, hey, we're going to start managing for big bucks in the state of Ohio. We're going to make your hunting license $500. Don't care if you're a resident or non-resident. Um, that would weed out. 30%, 40% of the hunters probably. Because they're going to say, I'm not paying 500 bucks for a resident license. It's already pretty dang expensive. I mean, it's like three... For non-res. Non which I am. Yeah. But I'm saying from even a resident standpoint. Could there. you bring in the dollar amount that's the same from less hunters, thus 
having less. Yeah, there's a break even point where that's not their goal though, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Like in theory, that works, but that's not the well, state's goal. What'll happen is people will just start harvesting them illegally. I don't think so. I think they'll just quit hunting, which goes back to that Depends whole on the person, that whole recruitment section. Because like I, yeah, I do think they'll be poaching. Like people who love hunting, yeah, and and just. Don't have that amount well, of money. It's, it depends how it gets applied, too. Because, like, ours is whatever, high 200s, low 300s or something for an either sex tag in Ohio. Yep. And then the way it works is you buy additional either sex tags, but you can only shoot one buck, so it's a doe tag. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, 76 bucks a piece. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, I'm not paying 76 bucks to shoot a doe, so I apply for crop damage tags. Yeah, I, I think it's just the... I, it's from the resident side because we talked about this in Pennsylvania. My dad and I talk about this all the time. It's like, listen, as a resident in Pennsylvania, I think for all my tags, including even bear and stuff, I pay like eighty bucks. Mm -hmm. I'd pay two hundred and fifty if they said tomorrow, "Hey, uh, hunting license, we, we're trying to raise well, more money." Just tied to that goal too. Like, it's I don't want to pay more in a license fee to a state whose objective is to get more hunters' harvest opportunities. Well, and see, I would pay. That's every state. I would pay more. To, you know, improve the the health of the herd, which t to me inherently would mean ultimately I should have bigger, box. older, healthier box. Yep. In, the, in the mindset of the states, I think it's healthy habitat, deer herds that are healthy regardless of age, mm -hmm. and more hunting opportunities. It's a fine line. Like, I get it. Uh, ultimately, like, I want a next generation, like my kids. I want them to have a next generation, as I know you do too. But it is a fine line to where, like, the amount of people coming in and the goals of the state and it, it comes back. It's such a weird thing. Like, again, I, I just, I have my, I know family that easily would just say, I just want to go out and kill a legal buck and they're 50 years old. Good for you, man. I don't like, I, I want a challenge. I want to hunt. And maybe it's because I spend more time. Like it is, that is my passion hunting and theirs isn't, but it's so weird. Cause I'm like, man, you've shot 30 bucks in your lifetime. None of them over one year old. <laughs> But in a lot of cases, that's the goal of the state. Thus, that's what they fall into as a hunter. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe if they got, maybe if they shot a four-year-old buck, they would be like, man, like, this is amazing. Like, I, how do I kill a bigger one next year? I don't know. I, I can't put myself in that position. But it, it, it's such a weird thing when we start to deal from a state level. And that's where, I, like, I like Eric's point of view on some of it, but. When you deal at a state level, their goals are a lot different than what I would consider a lot of the serious hunters. Like, what, serious hunting population is probably 10% of us? Maybe? Less than that? Way less. You, you, That's wait, what, wait, wait, what do you mean? Like, what are you trying to... Well, like, the people who really want to go out there and, like, are dedicated to passing bucks and killing big bucks. Oh, of all hunters? Yeah. Maybe three percent. Really? I think. So if we talk about Pennsylvania, let's just say there's... 500,000 deer When hunters. push comes to shove and that three-year-old walks under your stand, yeah, maybe 5%, 3 to 5%. Wow. Would be my guess. Not crazy. Probably depends on the state and, and if it's out of state. So out of like a half a million deer hunters in Pennsylvania, 25,000 of them would pass that kind of a deer trying to shoot a bigger deer. Yeah. That seems crazy. like it should be even lower when you put it that way. It's think, not about, think about twenty five thousand hunters passing on. Well, a, and I and I say that in reference to in terms of bucks. How many hunters? What was the numbers there? Um, so half a million deer hunters. There's half a million deer hunters in Pennsylvania. It's probably more than that, but all just combined, say. just license sales. Yeah. Okay. And then so five five percent would be twenty five thousand. <sighs> That's gonna be less than that. Well, and, and think about then. Between a hundred and ten and a hundred and fifty thousand bucks harvested a year in Pennsylvania. Hmm. So, and I would assume last time I checked, I think sixty percent of those were sixty percent of those were over two years old, two years old or older. Mainly really? because of antler restrictions, not because people are choosing. I was going to say, yeah, that's surprising. Mainly because of antler restrictions. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's it's a weird thing because, again, I'm not discouraging anyone from going out there and shooting the first legal buck they see. I think there's a there's a lot of benefits to that, and, and if ultimately you want to shoot a deer and you want to have meat and that's well, what you do, like, great. I think it, the people are just too, and it's because of the shaming stuff, but, like, people are touchy yeah. about, like, wishing 
people wouldn't shoot deer and stuff, but like from our objective, like I think it's perfectly okay to say like, yeah, I wish people wouldn't shoot as many, mm -hmm. you know, small deer. But I I also understand that like um, people are hunting for other reasons. It. Yeah, like, it's not you, shame. It's just it is. What if it you're is. seventy years old and you've killed fifty bucks in the state of Pennsylvania, and every one of them's a one year old, like. Or do awesome, even man. if you're my Good age, you. it's just what you want to do. Like that's fine. If it, you're within your legal limit, like that's that is. You're just out to shoot is. a buck. That's yeah. what you want. And if you love hunting and you love the resource, I am all for it. I am not for the shaming of those people. <clears throat> sure. Um, but it is a weird. It is a weird thing because obviously, let's just say there is hypothetically twenty five thousand of us that are like, yeah, I'm gonna pass all these three year olds, and I'm looking for a four plus year old buck. We don't. We're dropping the bucket. Oh, yeah. I it, wonder what percentage of those deer harvested are for. Less than 5%. I think. And I would say 4% of that 5% is luck. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> ours, ours, uh, us included. 1% one, one, <laughs> <Yeah>. one percent <laughs> had actually focused on a deer to kill that deer. The rest were, oh, that buck came by me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting, and, and obviously, if it's that small of a number, no wonder the state's not going to manage for our goal because we're not the controlling majority. We're not. Well, we're not what brings money into the state, at least the way it's set up. There is something to what you're saying of like, would would we pay more? But I mean, do you look how hard of a time we're having getting access to ground, like because it's so expensive? Well, but see, that's where I look at it from a from an aspect of um, state level. In that a state like Kansas, I will pay $500 every year to go and hunt Kansas as a non-resident. No brainer. Yeah. What's the tag out there cost? Is it six or seven? I think it's up to six now. Yeah. So let's say 600 bucks. I'll pay 600 bucks every year to go hunt Kansas. Well, we're paying more than that though. Cause what do you, well, but leases and everything else. Leases. I'm just talking in a license. It's that access to ground that gets expensive. I'm just talking in a license. That's what the state should do. If look, they want to make money, that's what I'm saying. buy up the ground and sell it to the hunters. That well, not even that, but it. look at Pennsylvania. Or lease it. What is driving me as a non-resident to come hunt Pennsylvania? What? Nothing. Nothing. I, I'm a resident, and I leave to go hunt elsewhere. <laughs> Nothing. I, I mean, it's an er, it's a it's a low barrier to entry, right? It's like 200 bucks for a non-resident tag. But, I mean, the state is not managing for big bucks, People go to Kansas not to kill a deer. They go to Kansas to kill well, big buck. They I go to Iowa to kill big people buck. People come to Pennsylvania probably for the Pennsylvania culture of hunting. Like they have family that's here, and so they want to come and hunt opening day of gun season with them. Mm -hmm. It's it's not big deer. Yeah, and that's just not what we're And frankly, for. that tradition's fading, which I hate. It makes that makes me cringe. Like I I have just some some of the best memories of hunting or my deer camp period. And that, but that, let's be honest, a tradition is fading out. So like, what's the next level? Because at some point you are seeing a decreasing trend, I think in resident hunters of Pennsylvania, the one thing that can continue to pipe some money in is a non-resident desire. Mm -hmm. Why are they coming here? Why would they come here? I don't know. I, I'd be curious to know. Can you look up and see if you can find out how many non-resident Pennsylvania tags have, were purchased last year? I, I bet it can't be very many. Less than 15,000. Has to be. Yeah. So it's just, it's just one of those things. Which is what, like 3 to 5% of total license sales? No, less Not than that. Like 1 to 2. 1 to 2, yeah. So it's just, it's a weird thing when you start to look at that. And again, part of it's the goal of, of what they're trying to do here. But, you know, Pennsylvania is an interesting one. I, I really hope we can pull all this together from a game commission standpoint because you've got a game commission, a fish commission, and a DCNR. There are no other states that have that. Everything is DNR, fish and wildlife. Mm -hmm. Like, they are together. We have a very separate entities which all have their own goals in mind, which almost makes it seem like, how does that state function? It's like we got to talk some sense into these guys when we get them out here. That's the plan. At least to hear it. I'm excited to get some guys. It sounds they're going to come in office. Will be the plan. We got him. This is. Is this license? Non-resident adult. What's the? Wow, fifty thousand. Scroll all the way to the top, real quick. Oh, that's two. Those are now. years. So okay. it's all the way to the right is most recent. Uh, yep, forty-eight thousand. So, I mean, it's fluctuated, but 48000 is more than I thought, plus the junior. So, you're talking over 50000 mm -hmm. Over 50000 non-resident tags. And then, where's our resident go up? 
Uh, up, 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 Wow, but look at that decrease. 100,000 plus wow. lost in the last decade. That's interesting, especially because the non-residents basically not changed. Flat I think it went up 2,000. Yeah. From 2009. Wow. Slightly. Started at 50. It went down. 2000. Down 2,000. It dropped and came back up, actually, last year. Well, that was new 19s. It, that's... That's a frightening scenario. I mean, you're resident people. You've lost 100,000 people in in a decade. I mean, every year. Drop, 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 drop. What would be interesting is, and if we get mad in here to talk about 2020 and the pandemic, did we see more people? Because that's what I'm hearing. Everybody's saying, man, we got so many new hunters in 2020. Did we? Yeah. I mean, dude, I think the reason Pennsylvania doesn't have – and it, it does have some big deer, but like generally speaking, the reason we don't have as big a deer is because the tracts of the land are smaller. I don't think it's because the soil quality is, I mean, it's not Iowa, but it's not, um, it's not terrible either. Um, it's just that every square inch of every personal property is getting hunted. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, and again, um, the reason we didn't get drawn for Kansas is because it's being highlighted as a it's bigger a, buck. It's a hate crime. <laughs> On you, I was seven for seven. <laughs> then I tie myself to you, and I get I drunk down to the bottom of the lake. Feel segregated against. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you've been one for three in the last three years. Those are not good odds. Yeah, you're lucky you're going to be guaranteed next year. Yeah, I don't. I'm not happy about it. I don't feel good about it. Well, I mean, I think this is the kind of discussions that hopefully we can get um, the the game commission involved in and, and talk about some of these things because it is from a, you know. I'm never going to stop hunting. Let's put it that way. But, you know, it is like my goals are different than the state goals for sure. Yeah, you just go hunt somewhere else. I just go hunt somewhere else. And I, well, dude, this, is what I said yesterday. this is what I said yesterday was like, man, mule deer hunting gets more and more appealing by the day. Like as we don't get drawn for Kansas, as we can't find places to hunt whatever mm. in Illinois or mm-hmm. whatever. It's like, let's just freaking go hunt mule deer in public land. Like there's plenty of opportunity for that. Yeah, for sure, man. Especially in a... You know, it's just I want. I'm here. I want to hunt here. Dude, I want to experience big bucks here. I want to you know, have you know excited hunts here because this is where I spend most of my time. You want to talk about, dude? How it'd be interesting to get somebody's perspective on like how different it is to try to get tags to hunt out west and how those states are managed versus you know over here in the east. I talked to AJ from yep. Velvet Antler mm-hmm. yesterday. He said that he didn't draw in his home state where he's a resident of Utah for an elk tag with 15 points really yep wow. he said some of those tags like your your sheep once, hunts and stuff once take a residents like 25 years to draw it is an interesting fact i mean when you start to look at how other states do it and draw states i will say that he got me pretty amped up about a colorado mule deer hunt did he's he? He, he's done a couple of them and he's like he's like yeah i've hunted the badlands he's like it's awesome he's like colorado is like next level he's like it's about as good as it gets he's like the hmm. thing the thing that's hard to prepare for is um it's just the elevation he's like you flatlanders have a tough time <clears throat> and so not worried about that yeah we'll just need to prepare for that and we're getting our gear in order and figuring mm-hmm. out what what do we need for a mule deer hunt mm-hmm. but dude i don't know if it's next year or the year following but like i think that a colorado high country mule deer hunt would be something to strive for mm-hmm. yeah i i think it'll be awesome it just always comes back to from October to mid December, I love whitetails. This is September, early I know. September. That's what I'm saying, and I th- I think that's all, like I'm all for it. But from yeah. October to mid December, I love whitetails. Yeah, where am I killing whitetails at? Yeah, me too. You know, and that it, it seems to be coming uh, an increasingly bigger discussion that it's like we're kind of willing to go wherever. It's not that easy. Yeah, well, we just haven't figured out the. I'm still of the belief though. If you just got on the phones and just and just stuck to it, you could get permission in some of these places. I know it's it's tough to come by yeah. and like, who knows what you're getting? Getting, yeah. You know, you got to certainly do your research. But if we really spent the time, I almost thought about like since we lost Kansas here, like dude, let's just add a couple days to our trip and let's just go knock on doors for two days and to see what we come up with. Where? Illinois. Mm. Like in that area, mm-hmm. or or any area, any area that we're like, hey, I think this is a good area. Yeah. Just go knock on doors for two days. Yeah. Certainly you're going to come up with something. You're not in two days going to get 100% no. Mm-hmm. Somebody's going to say yes. Unless you're Weston. 
How do you say no to, to this face? I, no. <laughs> well, that's how you do it, I guess. No. <laughs> Well, we appreciate everybody listening to this episode of the Hunter Podcast, number 19. Uh, appreciate, Eric, appreciate Eric Mitchell jumping on and, and talking a little deer research in Minnesota and Wisconsin with us. I mean, I'm intrigued by those kind of areas still, too. I think, um, you know, those kind of are two of those pinnacle deer tradition rich states that at some point I think we hunt, um, whether it's this year or next year. But I think it's definitely on the radar to, to go visit some of those upper Midwest areas. Um, I'd be all for getting into some of those driftless areas and killing a big old slob off of one of those yeah. ridges. They fly by, man. I think I think Wisconsin and you know Oklahoma are both states to look at. I don't know why Missouri is just not catching me. Is it's on there? I mean, I've hunted Missouri. There's big deer there. Warb and I obviously talked about it. I mean, uh, just to, again. There's what six or seven weeks that we're trying to hunt and cover hard for, and it's gone. And I'm always so pissed it. off when they pass, and it's like I had the whole year to prepare for this. Like, why did we not have? I will say Wisconsin's one that's intriguing, and I don't know about Minnesota, but they open mid September for really? bow season. Interesting, early season. Yeah, well, we'll just have to put some emphasis on some of these spots that maybe we. I think we got we got to get those feeders in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that for the remainder of September, for let's first of all, I want to make sure we do the September trip right. Yep, N- knowing we're not we don't have Kansas now. Like I don't know, maybe that adds a a day or two. Let's hey, let's spend four or five days in South Dakota and mm-hmm. and kill some bucks, and mm-hmm. let's do the same in North Dakota, and then let's come back and have those feeders rolling in Kentucky, mm-hmm. and just watch. I think that's the time. Is like from the time we get back from the mule deer hunt to October 1st mm-hmm. we'll just be watching those religiously and then from there we'll jump into Ohio Pennsylvania home farms maybe Illinois if it's bumping maybe yeah we'll, we'll have cameras running in Illinois we will have been out there to to move cameras around and we'll hang some stands and mm-hmm. stuff uh before then and like November it sounds like is the biggest shift where we're now going to plan on probably second week of November being our Illinois our rut trip, trip to mm-hmm. Illinois. Yep, and then work our way back Illinois if we have time. You know, perfect world. We just commit to Illinois, and that's what we do. And I don't, I just don't see us leaving Illinois to come back to Ohio. Maybe, maybe. Like, just don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, not if we've tagged out in Ohio, but we've got a lot of tagged out plans here. That yeah, uh, yeah, never really seems <laughs> never to go really out. works out. Uh, yeah, I want to yeah. make sure too. I want to make sure we don't like completely overlook, you know, our late season stuff too. Like, and so if that means getting a food plot into mm. Illinois, so, I think that's a big one that we'll look at here soon. Because probably all four of us are not going to tag out in Illinois. It'd be nice to, no. you know, come early December, have something start to show back up in Illinois, and say, okay, one or two of us go back. Just dodging the gun seasons. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. That's what it's all about. That's why we're here. That's why we're talking to y'all. Figure out. What our plans are, let you know. That's like a lag right now. Like I was planning on getting these beans planted. Yeah, weather's. Uh, well, my dad's heading out to my cousin's wedding in Montana, mm. and I kind of need him for a running tractor and mm-hmm. stuff. It's gonna be wet and sloppy and cold the next week, anyways. Yeah, so it looks like I'm not gonna get them in till the ninth. Should be fine. Yeah, it'll be fine. It's just what I do in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> not think about Kansas, apparently. Yeah. Yeah, I guess make make plans elsewhere mm-hmm. is the thing. Well, we appreciate everybody listening on our podcast. We will uh, be back next week with a new episode. Guest question mark? I don't know. Possibly you. Possibly you. <laughs> we appreciate everyone listening. Later. We'll see you next time. Bye.